things are popping in the Bellator MMA cage all summer long, and the heat is on tonight at Mohegan Sun Arena. Bellator 282 is stacked like Pringles. The prelims feature no less than nine ranked fighters, and later tonight at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, the main card culminates with the middleweight championship. The champ, Gegard Mousasi, in search of a golden milestone, 50 career wins defends against undefeated number one ranked contender Johnny Eblen, who hopes to become the seventh fighter to claim the Bellator middleweight belt. Also later tonight, the $1 million Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix continues with two more quarterfinal matchups. And we cannot wait to bring you the best action at 135, and we cannot wait to get things started right now alongside Big John McCarthy. I'm Mauro Ranallo. That is Mandel Nalo and Bryce Logan getting ready to do battle at 155 pounds as we begin our proceedings here tonight. Big John McCarthy, hello there. Give us the 411 on the tail of the tape. Well, I would love to because in this fight, you got to take a look at that reach, a 75 inch reach for Mandel Nalo against Bryce Logan, who he, he's a wrestler, so he's going to try to get inside. We'll see if he can do it. All right, here he is, the intergalactic voice of Bellator MMA, the one and only Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mohegan Sun Arena as we get set now to get Bellator 282 underway with the prelims kicking off now. Three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record: 12 wins, six losses by way of Dolan, South Dakota. He fights out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Bryce Logan. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot 11, weighing in 155 and one half pounds as a professional. Eight victories, two defeats, fighting out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Introducing Mandel, Rat Garbage, Nalo. And the referee in charge, Kerry Hatley. A regular stop on the Bellator MMA Global Tour. Mohegan Sun Arena getting set for a possible three rounds in the Bellator Our gentlemen, lightweight let's division. For you ready? Ready? Let's go to work. Bryce Logan battling Mandel Nalo and Nalo, three and two with one no contest in the Bellator cage, looking to bounce back from a second round TKO loss to Nick Brown in February. While Bryce Logan. He's trying to snap a two-fight losing streak, John. So lots on the line for these two if they want to remain in the so-called mix at 155. Hey, if they want to get into the mix. Absolutely, and Bryce Logan had a great fight against Mike Hamill. Back and forth, Mike Hamill just putting on a ton of pressure. He comes after you in this fight. Nalo, very technical in the way he goes about a fight. Very good, both in the stand-up. Look for the flying knees. Very quick with him. Nalo, trained by one of the best, Viras Zahabi. Large part of the success of the all-time great George St. Pierre out of TriStar Montreal. And Nalo, you mentioned it. Cerebral fighter told us that his opponent, Logan, moves well. He would have to try to mitigate that movement. Logan already showing a cut. Oh, and Nalo showing his power. That is a one-hitter quitter. He drew blood first, yep. and then he stopped him with a rocket right hand. Mendel Nalo getting it done in less than one, picking up his fifth knockout win. John, take us through the scintillating sequence. Oh my God, take a look at this shot. Bryce Logan, because we're talking about that 75 inch reach right on the butt. And you see Logan go face down. Nalo standing over him. Referee stops the contest. Just a beautiful counter strike right on the cheek. 107. 107. That was just as clean as it gets. And that's what we know about Nalo. He's that guy that's a technician. He's surgeon like with his strikes. If he can keep the fight at distance, he's dangerous for anyone. And there is the, the team of TriStar Montreal, Mandel Nalo. Taking out Bryce Logan like well. The best. 
taking him out like others might want to take out a guy named Rat Garbage, but he did get it done tonight. And John, uh, we talk about this division at 155 pounds. Patricky Pitbull getting ready to defend the title for the first time against Sydney Outlaws. We go to Tacoma, Washington for the first time July 22nd. But Mendel Nalo, that's how you bounce back from a loss. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. One minute, seven seconds. Round number one, the winner by TKO Mandel. Right garbage. Nalo. Last time he took an L. Tonight he bounced back in impressive fashion. Mandel Nalo now nine and two and four and two in the Bellator MMA cage. That's how you get a party of pain started here at the Mohegan Sun Arena. And speaking of a party, I believe we're going to have one at the fight desk tonight because, well, let Amanda Guerra tell you all about it. Amora, I wish we could just, like, have the camera here at the fight desk all night because it's going to be incredible. I'm Amanda Guerra. That is two-time world champ Josh Thompson. We have a special guest who is bringing the bling here on the desk, the Bantamweight interim champ with a taco meat to prove it. Rafion Sats, what is up, dude? You know, I'm just styling it profiling out here, you know what I'm saying? I got the animal print on, I got the taco meat out. I am enjoying my time here at the desk with you guys, and I'm excited for an amazing night of banger fights. It is going to be. So the reason you're able to be with us is because you are part of the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. You already had your fight there in the quarterfinals. We get two more tonight, uh, but your fight against Juan Archuleta and made you the interim champ. What was that like going through that? Man, it was amazing, you know? It was amazing the performance. I had an amazing time in Hawaii, and I got the strap, you know what I mean? So I'm the champ until the champ gets back, and I'm relishing in the fact of being the champ. Can I ask you what the heck that was right there? Uh, so that that, that uh, backflip, I, I got to say, you know, I'm the champ now, so please, somebody at Bellator, please take that from the reels, take that from the uh, highlights. Uh, I, I need that gone. That was my biggest regret of that fight was that backflip. So, uh, you know what I'm saying, let's make that happen. Are we looking to redeem ourselves in the next one with the backflip? I don't know if I can do a backflip to redeem myself, but if I can... I'll be looking to do that. That's that's what I'm studying. That's what I'm taping over. That's what I'm, you know, trying to accomplish. Maybe after the tournament is done. Look, it's going to be a great night. Uh, we might see that backflip again. Uh, for now, Moro, let's send it back down to you. Or actually, there you go. There's a Bantamweight World Grand Prix bracket. Uh, so, Josh, really quickly, give me some love for one of these fights. I want to talk about the one that's been all over social media, Danny Sabatello versus Leandro Higo, because there has been some chirping there. There's been a lot of chirping back and forth, but what I loved about Danny Sabatello this whole week, he said, look, you can talk as much as you want, but I got to go in there and prove it. He's going to go out there tonight and try and prove it, but he's got his hands full with Leandro Higo. There has been so much going back and forth on social media and here at Mohegan Sun. For now, Moro, back down to you. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. Two warriors who hope to possess the eye of the tiger getting set to do battle as Fabio Aguiar, one and one in Bellator MMA, takes on the newcomer from north of the border, Canada's Aaron Jeffrey, who brings an 11 and three mark into his Bellator MMA debut. Big John, take us through the numbers. Very simply put, you can take a look at the records. 18 and two for Fabio Aguiar. 11 and three for Aaron Jeffrey. If it wasn't for a contender series fights, he wouldn't he wouldn't be beaten. So both of very good fighters in the middleweight division. The 18 year old version of yours truly uh, envies the mullet of my fellow Canadian. Let's go to <laughs> Michael C. Williams. For those joining us tonight live on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Mohegan Sun as we get set now in the prelims tonight to go three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot two, weighing in 184 and one quarter pounds. His professional record: 11 wins, three losses from Tilsonburg, Ontario, Canada. Aaron Jeffrey. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 184 pounds as a professional. 18 victories, only two defeats from Jacife Pernambuco, Brazil, presenting Fabio F5 Aguia. And the referee in charge, Mark Goddard. So we are getting set for action between Fabio Aguiar's 110 of his last 11 coming off a win over Taylor Johnson at Bellator 265 last August. Aaron Jeffrey comes in with some hype from Canada. He's won five of his last six. 
He's a very good fighter. He's good both in the stand-up, on the ground. Aguiar likes to keep the fight in the standing position, even though he's outstanding as a jiu-jitsu practitioner. Aguiar now training at the Pitbull Brothers Gym, while Jeffrey trains out of Niagara Top Team and Aegis MMA under the likes of Chris Prickett, Lyndon Whitlock, and others. And now the clinch as the BJJ Brown Belt, Jeffrey gets it on with Aguiar, who is known for a well-rounded game when it comes to finishes, John, for Aguiar. Six wins via first-round knockout or submission, evenly distributed at three apiece. Yeah, he is very good, and the real question is, how is his wrestling going to match up to Jeffrey's? Right now, he's got that body lock position, both hands up high. We'll see if he can get the takedown. Jeffrey attended Brockett University and studying medical sciences, graduating in 2015. And while he never wrestled with the school team, he said he trained with them often over the past decade and has picked up a wrestling tip or two from the number one team in the True North Strong and Free. Well, his wrestling is actually really good for a guy, like you're saying, he did not wrestle competitively. His wrestling in his MMA fights shows that he knows exactly what he's doing at times. But in this position right here, here, Aguiar definitely has the advantage. Aguiar keeping Jeffrey stapled to the fence. Hobbling for position, Jeffrey trying to turn the tables, as it were. Well, at least Jeffrey was able to dig that left underhook. That's why he was able to turn the position. Now he's more into a 50-50 instead of someone that has an advantage on <laughs> Two minutes have elapsed here in the opening round, and it's been a battle for control of the clinch, John. It has been, and you're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of people are going to look at it and go, oh, they're just kind of, you know, just dancing around. There's a whole lot of energy being put out by both men right now. And you see a high crotch coming from Jeffrey. Very nice job. He still doesn't really have that takedown. We'll see if he can make it happen, but he's looking for that guillotine right now. He's looking for a front choke, and it's tight. You can see right now, that's got a lot of pressure on it. That's why Aguiar is going towards his back. Aguiar's never been submitted. Jeffrey looking to submit him here as we cross the midway point of the opening round, and Jeffrey has right three submission wins. Aguiar trying to survive right now. And the choke is being put on tight. Getting to his feet actually increases the pressure on the choke. Aguiar just being able to make it through it, but when you see the space being crushed by Jeffries, there's a ton more pressure being put on that neck. And Jeffrey, of course, speaking of expending energy, really putting the squeeze on and trying to get it over with here in the first round of his Bellator MMA debut. Aguiar not capitulating yet. No, he's not, but I'll tell you what, it's tight. What is it? You see him looking, he's locking up the same as a Mato Leone as a rear naked choke. He's just doing it in the front. He just has to elevate those hips, bring the pressure up. He keeps on trying to adjust. Aguirre's just got enough space where he's able to survive right now. You see him digging his fingers into that forearm. And Jeffrey releases the grip, maintains positional control, delivering some elbows from the side, putting the pressure and putting a beating on Fabio Aguiar with just over a minute left here in the first round. An impressive start to the Bellator MMA tenure for the 29-year-old Canadian Aaron Jeffrey. All of that coming off of one high crotch lift to the ground, one mistake of where you put the head. The real question is, how is Jeffrey's arms? And Did he blow his arms up going for that choke? And in the end, Fabio Aguiar remains in the fight. He's in a standing position now, again, battling for control in the clinch, reversing, trying to reverse. And Jeffrey looking for a trip takedown with 30 seconds left in the opening round. You know, we're talk, we talk about Jeffries with his, his arms, but you got to look at Aguiar. There was a lot of time there. He wasn't getting much air. A lot of pressure on that neck throughout the round. And more pressure on the neck now as Aguiar getting his takedown attempt stumped by Aaron Jeffrey. Final 10 seconds of the first frame.
watching action in the middleweight division. Middleweight championship fight coming up later tonight in the main event of Bellator 282. How do you feel? Good. On the outside, I want you to jab low kick, real low, calf kick, right? He's not going to be there. He's leaning back, jab the head, jab the body, jab the head, jab the body, jab the head, calf kick. He's going to run. Right, listen to Chris, man. I love it. On the underhook, just dig and yeah. don't give him those double underhooks. Okay. He's dangerous with double underhooks. Don't give him double underhooks and you're good. Okay. Love the single leg, man. Yeah. That joke this. was there. Yeah. You want to go guard, it's there. I know it's high risk, but fuck yeah. Okay, brother, let's have some fun. Good coaching in Aaron Jeffries' corner as he gets set for the second round of this fight against Fabio Aguiar. They want him to avoid the underhooks. And they don't mind high risk because, hey, it can lead to high reward, especially in what is essentially, you know, a, an audition as he gets rattled with the right hand from Aguiar. But again, Aguiar telegraphing the shot, John. Yeah, he did. But it was one thing I was just going to say, the one thing that Jeffries needs to always be careful of is the right hand of Aguiar. He's got power in it. He throws it, you know, all the way from down in Florida to come up to Connecticut. But <laughs> he does have power when it lands. Half of his 18 wins have come via a form of a knockout and uh, second round taking shape very much like what we saw in the first round they have they might have to start paying rent on that side of the fence they're <laughs> spending a lot of time there well jeffries has that wizard and he's looking he just decided that instead of going for that underhook kind of going after the neck again just putting pressure on him. He's going to make Aguiar make the decision. Do I leave my neck here with my arms extended around the body, or do I start to defend? Aguiar with dogged determination trying to take Jeffrey off his feet, but Jeffrey putting his weight on the back of Aguiar, including his neck. Uh, and the whole thing that you're looking at, you saw his hands come apart. That's a big tell that, oh, he's losing that position. And to go to your knees, look, if you're Jordan Burroughs, go to your knees. Most guys in wrestling don't go to your knees if you're looking for that takedown. Burroughs, of course, an NCAA standout, and uh, we Olympic gold medalist. We will see an NCAA <laughs> Division I wrestler challenge Gegard Musashi for the middleweight title coming up later tonight. The undefeated Johnny Eblen, American top team. Hey, that's an NCAA Division I wrestling factory, and you, you were telling me about something that Dan Lambert has put together with uh, no other than Kale Sanderson and Penn State. There is an American top team up at College Station now. Bo Nickel coming out of that. There's going to be some special fighters coming from that area. And all of that work that you saw Aguiar looking for that takedown. He took, a, he took a lot of shots. Jeffrey is taking a lot of, uh, delivering a lot of shots now, though, on Aguiar, especially a right hand over the top. And really setting it up, peppering him up with a jab, and then landing the right hand and backing Aguiar to the fence. Yeah, Jeffries has been doing a very nice job of what we just called dirty boxing, being, you know, nice short elbows, hands just rattling him. Continue to put shots on him, make him feel it. Jeffries has not stopped at all in any of this, but it, if you're looking at Aguiar, he's starting to wear down a little bit. You can see he's slowing down and he's giving positions that he did not give before. Dirty boxing synonymous with another NCAA division. That's out good friend Randy Couture. And uh, here you are watching Jeffrey just put the pressure on Aguiar and delivers. Oh, that was a big elbow. Elbows and knees. And Aguiar oh. falls face first to the canvas. That's how you make a first impression in Bellator MMA. Oh, Canada. Aaron Jeffrey turning it into KO Canada. That was very impressive. You know, at the start when I talked about the contender series, the real thing is it's that the, the bright lights and you want to win so bad. But coming into this, the question was, was he going to have that mindset of 
not being nervous. Huge elbow, that right elbow landed. Nice knee coming up. Tries to bring another one, then just jackhammers the left hand until Mark Goddard makes a great stop. Really impressive debut performance for one of your fellow Canadians there. And what a stash. Hey, <laughs> Toronto's Austin Matthews, the Hart Trophy winner, is the NHL's most valuable player playing with the Leafs. He's got to he's got to be impressed with that stash. And you have to be impressed with Aaron Jeffrey getting it done, vanquishing Fabio Aguiar and picking up a knockout win in his first fight inside the Bellator MMA cage. Improves to 12 and 3, has eight knockouts now on his resume. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end three minutes, 30 seconds into round number two. The winner by TK Ho, Jeffrey. Mullet Mania running wild inside the Bellator MMA cage. Aaron Jeffrey getting a, an A-plus in his Bellator MMA debut with that impressive stoppage win. With more, let's go back to Amanda Guerra and company at the fight desk. What a way to begin the night here, Moro. Let's talk main event here. Amanda Guerra, Josh Thompson, Rafian Stotts, our interim Bantamweight champ here. Uh, Gegard Musasi going up against a guy like Johnny Evelyn here. Two different stories here. Let's talk Gegard Mousasi. This would be his 50th win of his career, Rafian. How legendary is this guy? Man, Gegard is so legendary. He's been around the game since I started, like even way before I started the game. And it, it just speaks to the, the amount of experience, the amount of experience at a high level. Gegard is the real deal. He's a legend at his body. Yeah, he is just somebody that he's... In terms of being a legend, but he's a technician. And, they, and Big John talks about this all the time. He is someone that has so many fights, but very rarely takes damage. And that's why his longevity in this career, in this sport, has been so long. The vicious ground and pound that he delivers, but he is very well-rounded all the way around. We're talking from the feet, from the feet, to the wrestling, to the jiu-jitsu, everything. He possesses every single part that you need to be a top-level MMA fighter. He's fought at heavyweight, okay? He's fought at, he's been a light heavyweight world champ at strike force. He is the middleweight champ here in Bellator. He has been considered one of the best fighters in the world since he's come into this sport. The reason why he doesn't get the recognition he deserves He's almost like as if his heartbeat never gets above 60. He wakes up, rest your heart. He shows up with his glasses and his hat and his flip-flops. He's so chill about it. Uh, but we love him for that. Let's talk about Johnny Evelyn here because this is a college wrestler, wrestler excuse me, turned fast-rising MMA star. Rafian, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. You're going up against a guy like Musasi. This is your 12th fight. You're undefeated. How do you get ready for that? You know, I think Johnny's approaching it the right way. You know, you can't let the big lights and the big, you know, uh, it's one fight, you know? It's one fight, you take care of this one fight, it's a simple task, and it's really a simple task. It's a tall task, but it's a simple task, you know? You go in, you beat a legend. So. BJ, BJ Penn used to say this all the time, I don't have to be better than him every single day, I just gotta be better than him that one night. Gotcha. And it makes a lot of sense. Johnny Evelyn possesses power in his hands, which he's fallen in love with, which he's gonna need to use tonight, but he's gonna have to make sure that he mixes it in his, mixes in his top level wrestling with his hands. He cannot go out there and expect just to wrestle, and he cannot go out there and expect just to stand. That is a recipe for disaster against someone like Gegard Mousasi. When Johnny Evelyn fought John Salter, he had good moments, and he had moments where it was a lapse of error, where he just all of a sudden thought, okay, I got to do this, when it wasn't the right call. But he came through and dominated the fight from beginning to end. So I'm really critiquing the little things when I talk about that, but where he is good is on the feet, wrestling, and he's got nasty ground and pound when he gets on top. And still or new champion tonight, we will find out 9 Eastern, that main card kicking off on Showtime. For now, let's send it back down tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. We are getting set for featherweight action here at Bellator 282. The undefeated Cody Law, he's on the left, 6-0, four knockouts, one submission. Takes on James Gonzalez, turning 32 on July 2nd. But, hey, you talk about laying down the law, John McCarthy. Oh, he laid down the law in this fight. And not only laid down the law, predicted the exact moment 
of the ending of the fight at 1 minute 17 seconds, wrote it down the night before, and then just made it happen. So there's more than one mystic fighter in mixed martial arts as we go to the tail of the tape for this featherweight fight. And the real thing to look at is that 6-0 by Cody Law, James Gonzalez, an outstanding young fighter, has had some very tough fights. Gonzalez making his first four-way inside the Bellator MMA cage. Here is Michael C. Williams with the official introductions. A good evening and welcome to all those in the UK joining us live on a BBC iPlayer as we continue now here at Bellator 282. The prelims go to the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner. At five foot nine, weighing in 145 and three-quarter pounds, his professional record eight and five. He fights out of Shirley, New York, James Alicat Gonzalez. Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145 and three quarter pounds. As a professional, he's undefeated at six and oh, fighting out of Coconut Creek, Florida, by way of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Introducing Cody no. and the referee in charge once again, Mark Goddard. Cody Law, part of the American Top Team contingent, competing here tonight again. Four knockouts, one submission, yet to taste defeat. And for James Gonzalez, making his Bellator MMA debut at eight and five with two knockouts, two submissions. And man, you talk about the embarrassment array of riches at American Top Team, but you also have to then give a shout out to the, the camp that James Gonzalez represents to the best there with Ray Longo and Matt Serra on the Serra Longo fight team. Yeah, Law MMA is an outstanding group. Ray Longo, a great trainer. Matt Serra, you know, unbelievable Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Authored the biggest upset no, in MMA against no doubt. our no doubt. friend George St. Pierre that we talked about earlier. And did it, did it with ferocity. And hey, Cody Law's been doing it with ferocity thus far in his Bellator MMA career, but he is looking to do it again here tonight. But Number nine ranked fighter. It's the one thing you're looking at is, you know, out of law MMA, James Gonzalez is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but he's got to get the fight there. And can he take someone like Cody Law down? Or is he going to have to use his hands to try to hurt Cody in the stand up? Oh, get the fight to That's what we want. Ah, beginning to piece him up there with the left and the right. We have Law against a, a member of the Law fight team. And boy. You know both of them want to make it lawless if they had their druthers again looking to make an impact in his first fight in Bellator MMA. James Gonzalez looking to celebrate his birthday early. But for Cody Law, what's impressed you the most as you've seen him blossom inside the Bellator cage? What's really impressed me about Cody is he came in as a wrestler with some boxing background but had a hard time transitioning between the two and making decisions on when he was going to go. Now you see, look at it, look at all the tips, look at the kick, just like I'm talking about right here. He is now transitioning to all elements of mixed martial arts, and he's doing it very well. And it was here at Mohegan Sun Arena where Cody Law fought for the first time as a professional fighter, splitting the guard, going with that textbook one-two. He is very fluid, very comfortable when it comes to switching stances as Gonzalez tagged him with a left head kick. And as we've talked about in the evolution of MMA, in mixed martial arts, you better be comfortable switching stance. You've got to. Anymore, you've got to switch stance because you've got too many guys that can attack the legs. You've got to have times when you take away their targets. The big thing about Cody, take a look at how he throws his punches. Straight shots down the middle, they get there fast. Cutting right head kick, Gonzalez has also looked good delivering some kicks, but he's seen some shots from the undefeated law. We've passed the midway point of what has been an action-packed opening round. Yeah, but you gotta really like what James Gonzalez has done as far as he's trying to return. He's not just accepting, he's looking for his counter options. And there's the difference. Don't go back, circle out just like you saw him do. After a couple steps, then he circled out, just do it a little bit quicker. Under two minutes left in the first round. 
Silva employing some feints, switching stances, body kicked by Gonzalez. And there's Gonzalez going over the top, maybe behind the, to the back of the head, but just behind oh, the ears. Definitely not behind the, I mean, yes, it may have landed there, sure, but it's a not, legal blow the yeah. way he throws it. Can't help if Cody Law ducks his head now. And you can see the the, the marks on oh, Law's body. Gonzalez has landed some kicks, and now Gonzalez putting pressure on Law, fishing for a submission before Law pops out. And that was a very nice attempt by James Gonzalez. We talked about, is he going to be able to take someone like Cody Law down? He caught the leg, went for the takedown, but wasn't able to keep him in that position. Law trying to take Gonzalez down with head kicks and punches. Law credits his success to being self-motivated as he delivers another scoring combination to the head of Gonzalez as we have crossed the final minute mark. James started to duck his head a little too much. He needs to be careful. Oh, look. Eating a steady diet of those right head kicks. Cody is seeing that he's dropping his head when he's throwing, so he's going to catch him on one of those. You can do that every so often. You just cannot start going back to the well on it. Law looking to close the distance. Pine with the jab. There's a tap kick. Under 30 seconds left in what has been a great round of action. High quality stuff here between Cody Law and James Gonzalez, who, while having been outpointed, has had his moments, John. He's had a lot of moments. And, and look, I, and when I watched him fight, I was like, oh. Look at some of the people that he fought. He's fought some outstanding young fighters. Guys like Pat Sabatini. I mean, this guy can fight. Has never been stopped. Comes into Bellator with a record of eight and five, but in tough, looking to derail the Cody Law Express. It's a close round. I thought you won, but it's close enough. We, we, we can't count on it for sure. Um, we need a little more volume, right? A little more volume. Love what you just and heard from Mike Brown there. Your, your right hand is falling just short. We need to cover a little more distance. Two big steps, and then the right hand will be there. Sometimes come back with a hook. Yeah. Also, Artem Levin, the great kickboxer in his corner. Speaking of kicks. Artem Levin has landed enough good kicks in his life. That Cody Law, again, watch the, when he throws a lot of these nice kick right off of the jawline there, just at the end of the toes. But both guys landing their shots. I think overall Cody Law landed the better shots throughout the round, but a very good showing by James Gonzalez. And Mike Brown wants Cody Law to pump up the volume, pump up the volume. And for James Gonzalez, his corner wants him to continue to try to apply smart pressure. It is about smart pressure. You can you cut, just coming forward is not good. Although coming forward successfully is Cody Law at the beginning of round two. That was a nice job of circling, circling out by Gonzalez. And Gonzalez possesses educated kicks. I've seen crescent kicks. I've seen the switch kicks. There's he's definitely been schooled in the art of kickboxing, but looking to put together all of the tools that comprise mixed martial arts in order to be successful in his debut under the bright lights. There's a right hand that landed for Law, and Law really befuddling him, bedeviling him by, by switching stances so fluidly. I agree with you, that switching of the stance and not understanding where the shot's gonna come from. Is it gonna be with the hands or the feet? He's got James Gonzalez just a little bit confused. Southpaw Gonzalez gets tagged with, well, the Southpaw's public enemy number one, that right hand down the middle. And you'll notice when Cody Law throws it straight, he's landing it every time. It's when he starts to loop it, Gonzalez does a good job of getting his head offline and out of the way. Jumping knee by Gonzalez as Law countered again with the right uppercut. Inside kick by Gonzalez. Gonzalez winging that right hand as he dropped his head and he almost got dropped with that straight left from Law. That was a nice little check left hook by Cody Law. 
He saw the opening. He actually said he's seeing when James Gonzalez is starting to dip his head and take his eyes off the target. All about timing as Law partially blocked that head kick by Gonzalez, and Gonzalez just avoided again that right uppercut by Cody Law. Gonzalez telegraphing a jump knee, goes for the calf kick. And there's a lead left hand by Gonzalez. Nice attack by Gonzalez. Kick blocked by Gonzalez. Is Law going to the body? And I don't know, orthodox offensive attack by Gonzalez. I, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was the elbow or, yeah, or, yeah, exactly. or a tap of the hammer fist. <laughs> Whatever makes you stand out and successful, right, John? Absolutely, whatever works. <laughs> there he goes again. Right hook to the line. Oh, nice left hand again by Gonzalez. Mike Brown saying to Law, you can use the cage for takedowns. Again, Law, an NCAA D2 national wrestling champion. In his collegiate career. Cody Law definitely has the advantage when it comes to the wrestling, but you gotta ask, does he want to take James Gonzalez down? James is a black belt in Brazilian nice, Jiu-Jitsu. Nice. He's putting himself in a position where possibly, you know, the submissions of Gonzalez can be applied. So I understand why he's staying up. Well, and he good, 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 good. Yeah, defends the takedown attempt score. by Gonzalez, score. delivering a knee on the exit. Very nice. And that's the whole thing you want to do. Anytime you have that opportunity to land on the exit, just like you saw Law do, that's what you want to see. And again, that's also something I'm sure he picked up from Artem Levin in, in kickboxing, where a lot of these. Oh, and there's a right hand over the top by Gonzalez. And Gonzalez in his. You know, moments of going even orthodox has had success with the right hand from orthodox, but now back to Southpaw. Right hand down the middle by Law, and again, Gonzalez coming forward. See, Gonzalez starting to press forward now. He's starting to control the position of the fight. He's starting to control the engagements. And yet, Law proficient with the counter. And yet, James Gonzalez coming forward. Final 20 seconds of the second round. Right hand landed for Gonzalez. Battling through the low blow. Yeah, too. that that definitely was a low blow, and he just said, "No, nope, I don't care. Let's go." But right back to fighting. You got to give it up for him. James Gonzalez has put on a great exhibition no, here. Hey, he's hey, come out. He's come out to win this you, fight. Right? I don't yeah. believe that he's in position right now to do so. I think he's behind, but man, he's pressing. He's putting a lot of pressure on Law, and he's trying to make him get tired and break him down. First round. That's it. You know what to do. Let's go, James. James, keep effort. Yeah, you need to win this round. You need to win this round. Mike Brown, sense of urgency, saying you need to win this round, you need to win this round, which may be a case of the veteran fighter turned coach just I making I love sure. the fact that that's what yeah. Mike Brown is telling me. Don't sit there and say, oh, you're up. I yeah. got you up. No, Keep say, hey, motivated. you need to win this round. Yep. One, two. Kick off round Good three. Shot. Now's when you're talking about Chris Gonzalez. Stop throwing just the ones. Go towards more combinations because you never know which one of those one, two, threes is going to land and do some damage. Oh, and he's going after that. Punches at Cody Law. Sense of urgency definitely on the part of Gonzalez. Knowing that he is most likely behind on the judges' scorecards as Law 
attempting a takedown. Defended by Gonzalez. Push kick by Gonzalez. Nice push kick. Needs to go back to that. And he is. He knows that that landed and that Cody did not like the way it felt. Cody live. Undefeated at 6-0 is on a three-fight knockout streak, and uh, Gonzalez was looking perhaps for the knockout, delivering that right cross that landed across the jaw of Cody Law. And again, lead right hook lands for Gonzalez. And the pressure seems to be slowing Cody Law down a bit. John. I agree with you. You know, there's just some guys, no matter what you do, we just call them they're unbreakable. They will not stop. They will not quit. You can the only thing you can oh, do is Gonzalez looking for the submission. That's tight. That's why Cody Law went down. He felt it. And Gonzalez looking for the dramatic finish here in round three has two submission wins, a triangle choke and a Kimura. And now he's in top position on Cody Law. He's got full mount on Cody Law. He has put Cody Law in a position where he's in trouble, now has his back. And putting in the hooks and James Gonzalez turning 32 July 2nd. No better way to celebrate a birthday than by recording a huge victory over a surging Cody Law in Gonzalez's Bellator MMA debut. Nice. He has more than enough time to get it done here, John. He's got plenty of time. That was a nice job by Gonzalez to switch that up. He switched position. Cody Law could not sit there the way he is. He's turning into that choke. That's not good. And he allowed, exactly, he cannot allow that hand to go up there and lock behind his head. You gotta figure, James Gonzalez, a Matt Sarah Black belt. the biggest adversity of his career. James Gonzalez now just over two minutes left. Looking to put the finishing touches on this submission. Cody's done a good job of turning his head now. Now that choke is not quite where it's gonna be effective. And it's, the grip has been released, John. So Cody Law weathering the storm thus far in terms of the pressure and the submission attempts and now the Striking from the back by Gonzalez. Well, Cody Law's got his, he's got the foot. If you take a look at that figure four, it's in the right position for him to turn inside of it. Now it's not good. You see the foot up in the air. It's much harder for him to turn within that figure four. Body triangle employed by Gonzalez. Minute 20 now left in the fight. And Gonzalez peppering the body, the rib cage with these shots, hoping that Law will be forced to let go of his grip on the wrist. And Cody Law cannot just accept this to ride it out. This could be Wayne bad for him because he could have won both the first and the second round. It could be that it was 1-1. If he loses this round, he could either lose the fight or can end up being a draw even if they go to a 10-8. Mike Brown implored him, you need to win this round. Well, it's James Gonzalez doing his best to win the round and perhaps record the upset Beautiful in his right Bellator elbow. MMA debut. You see that right elbow to the ear? That did not feel good. Cody Law trying to do everything he can to keep. James Cody Law able to escape the front go. It was impressive. Now 25 seconds left. Law looking for the Beautiful elbow. step over. Nice step over by James, but he's too high. Oh, elbows to the top of the head. McCarthy, when you take a look at what has transpired over the last 15 minutes, how do you have it on your unofficial scorecard? Look, unofficially, I thought that both the first and second round were close, but I thought Cody Law had the better shots. I would have given him those 10-9, but I would have given James Gonzalez a 10-8 here in the third round. He dominated that round. He did damage in that round. I have this as a draw.
James goes after him with this. Nice little right left that I talked about. He needed to open up with more combinations, not the singles. And then he ends up getting this front headlock position, sits down, and you know that it was feeling tight. That's why Cody went with it. And from this point, James Gonzalez just started putting it on Cody Law. Went for the choke, wasn't able to get it. Right here, Cody goes to change position, get back to where he's gonna be on top. Nope, steps over, locks in a figure four here, just starts elbowing the top of the head. If you've ever been elbowed to the top of the head, it does not feel good. That's damage. 68 strikes landed to 122, and that is all. A ton of those are the third round because James Gonzalez took over in that round. One takedown, and if you were going to guess who was going to get that takedown, you would have thought it would have been Cody Law. No, it is James Gonzalez. A paramount takedown and some impressive statistics here as we await the official decision. Cody Law looking to go 7-0 and oh with by far his toughest fight here in Bellator. And for James Gonzalez again on the eve of turning 32 years of age, looking to bounce back from a split decision loss in his last fight and hoping to, well, make a, a big statement here in his first fight that we'll find out now. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, John English, scores the fight 29-27. Brian Miner, 29-28. Kevin McDonald, 30-26. to All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. James Alicant Gonzalez. Happy early 32nd birthday to James Gonzalez. Victorious in his Bellator MMA debut, knocking Cody Law from the ranks of the undefeated via unanimous decision. Welcome to Bellator MMA. All right, let's go back to Amanda Gitta. Tomorrow, I'll tell you what, it's a party up here on the fight desk. Let's talk about the Bantamweight World Grand Prix that's going to continue tonight. The quarterfinals, we have Mr. Rafion Stotts with us. You got your fight out of the way, so you're chilling now. You got the taco meat. Are we, like, doing one button, yeah, every, like, per hit? Yeah, every every uh, time you see me, you're going to see another button come out. You're going to see a little bit more taco meat. You might even see a nipple. You might. <laughs> and that is why we are on YouTube right now. But we look forward to that on Showtime here. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the fights we do got coming up tonight. Here is the bracket right now. As I mentioned, Rafion, he is already on. He is waiting, however, for the winner of Leandro Higo and Danny Sabatello. Uh, Josh, I want to talk to you about that fight. Danny Sabatello, ultimate trash talker. We've heard him chirping. He walked into our meeting this week with a Higo sucks shirt on. But sure enough, we saw some little chirping from Higo this week going back at him. Yeah, it was good because he needed that. He let everyone know that he wasn't in his mind. After making weight, all that stuff is behind you. Now it's nothing to do but fight. Rafion, you like to talk the trash. You love it. How does this get into his mind, though, between Danny and Higo? You know, I would, I would, I have to disagree with you, John, or Josh. I have to disagree with you. I feel like he's in Higo's head. I feel like the, I, this is the first time I've ever heard Higo talk trash. I try to talk trash to him. I, I did a whole excerpt on how bad he looks and stuff like that. He ain't said a word back to me. You know, <laughs> so I think he's in Sabatello's head, and I think Sabatello is gonna be Salatebo, Salatebo, whatever his name is tonight. <laughs> I, I will tell you that Higo told us. He said, "I'm gonna save the media from Danny Sabatello." That, that, I mean, that's some pretty good trash talking there. Uh, let's talk about the fight we have coming up just before that, though. Magomedov versus Barzola here. Uh, Josh, set up this fight for us because this one, we could see fireworks. Yeah, you're looking for Magomedov basically to just impress and get push the grind on Barzola. He's going to have to keep him controlled, make him work from every position, but try to slow the pace of this fight down. If you're Magomedov, how do you stop Barzola from continuing to press that pace on you and using his cardio as a weapon? I think Magomedov's got to do what Magomed does best. He gets to those dominant positions really well. He gets to the back well. He takes people down and holds them down well. He does great on his ground and pound. Uh, he has the backpack positions. So I think if he gets to those positions, it could be a good night for Magomed and Magomed. I'm going to go get you some pasties between this break. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> As I said, I'm glad we're on YouTube right now. <laughs> Moro, back down to you. Better you, Amanda, than I, is all I can say as we get set for flyweight action between Alejandra Lara looking to snap a two-fight losing streak and Ilara Jowani, who is looking to do the same thing. 
Take us through the tail of the tape for this important encounter at this weight class. You know, these ladies match up very well. The big difference is that height at five foot three to five foot seven for Lara and a big five inch reach advantage for Alejandra Lara. With the official introductions here once again is Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Mohegan Sun Arena, the prelims at Bellator 282 now feature a flyweight fight set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 125 pounds even. Her professional record, nine wins, six losses, fighting out of Matal Rio Grande do Norte, Brasil, Ilada Johanne. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 125 and one half pounds. Currently ranked number five, the former title challenger enters tonight at nine and five from Medellin, Colombia, presenting Alejandra Azul Lara. In charge of the action, your referee, Kevin McDonald. Fighting is more mental than anything. Lara, looking to snap a two-fight losing streak, took up meditation, changed her diet. Joani, well, she felt that she should have deserved the decision against Vanessa Porter in her last fight. She's won three of five, but both of them looking to rebound from back-to-back -back defeats. Both of them looking to stay alive, and both of them looking to take it to each other from the start. Joani going right after her. Big shots, Alejandro Lara exchanged, came back with a counter. Now we're in the clinch, we're gonna see who can get this position. We're taking the fight to the ground. It looks like Joani wants to. Yeah, for Joani, six of her seven wins via knockout or submission have come in the first round. And for Lara, she has five wins, including four knockouts in the opening round. And she talked in depth, John, about the changes that she has made in terms of her lifestyle and knowing that she, you know, she feels she's much better than her, her record indicates these days and, and is willing to make those sacrifices to remain in the hunt. Well, she is, she's actually fought the top of the, the food chain and as far as here at Bellator. Exactly, she's a young fighter. She had one loss coming in, that was to uh, Mazo. She's a good fighter. She is progressing and she's getting better. That's the one thing you see. And I think that's one of the reasons that you see Yoani trying to get the takedown here because she has seen that Lara has gotten much better on the feet. She's good on the ground, but in the ground and pound position, Yoani can do a lot of damage. And the common thread continues because Yoani has also been working with a sports psychologist and nothing that is out of the ordinary, especially these days, in whatever way that can give you the edge. So both of them, again, looking to reverse their fortunes here in Bellator MMA. And of course, Lara looking to reverse position as Joani secured the takedown, but needs to now make it count. Well, Joani jump into the back as Lara gave that motion trying to turn she's trying to turn inside of the guard now using the fence as a pressure point that actually helps her in turning here and Giovanni was looking for her third submission win via rear naked choke but Giovanni if she continues on with this and just holds her position is able to pop her head out she's going to come out with back control Giovanni also holds a knee bar that came in her last submission win over Beck Rollins. There it is. Back in October 2019. Yuani doing a nice job knowing that all I have to do is continue to just get a little bit further, a little bit further. I'm going to get my head out. She did. Takes the back. Now going after the arm. She lost it. Yuani used to work at the front desk for the Pitbull brothers. Here's a scramble. Great and job. Job by Jawani to remain in top position. Your full mount, John, but she went from working the front desk to becoming a, a formidable professional fighter, and, and she's looking to move her Bellator record to two and two here tonight. Look, if you work for the Pitbull brothers, you gotta fight. <laughs> Dominant position here for Yuani to see if she can do damage here. 
She was able to maintain that mount. That was not easy to do. She did a great job of maintaining it. Now she just needs to get some type of posture at times so she can land heavy shots. Lightweight champion. Getting it done here. It's of course the you're always looking to to do your homework, John. And when you when you look at two opponents here who again, yes, they're in the midst of two fight losing streaks, but it doesn't take away from from their credentials as fighters. No, not at all. I mean, you're taking a look and everything you're seeing right now from Ioana, she's getting better on the ground. If there was a weakness that she had in her game, it was the ground hurt. She really enjoyed the stand up. She had power in her hands, but on the ground, lost to Watanabe based upon, you know, not being able to get out of positions like this. Well, now she's holding Alejandro Lara in these positions and doing damage and showing, you know what, I have improved a lot, and this is now a strength. Yeah, both fighters defeated by Kana Watanabe. Liz Carmouche, the new flyweight champion, and now Jawani again. As Lara brings it back to the feet, but Jawani continues to look for that submission. But it's all about position, and now Lara lighting up Jawani on the exit. And she clicked, clocked her with the right hand. She clocked her with the right hand and left, and he's done it multiple times. She buckled Jawani's knees momentarily. Jawani being backed up. But now Lara has to be careful. Oh, and the bell rings. I was going to say Lara has to be careful not to punch herself up, but after being in the clutches of Jawani for so long, she had to empty everything in her arsenal. She went after you gotta like it. You know what? I'm not gonna sit here and just take it. You had your turn, now it's mine. Take a look at what happens once Laura gets her head out. Left hand lands clean, right hand. Again with the right hand. It's just going after now. A little bit wild, yes, but it's effective because she's landing. And as she's landing, Ioani having some problems stopping the attack. She tries to slow her down. Back comes Alejandro Lara to try to open it up again. Ioani, let, Ioani ate some big shots. She was able to just weather the storm. But going out for the second round, Lara's got to feel pretty good. The bell and round uh, number two adjustments you want to see both uh, Lara and uh, Joani make here in this second round, John. Well, the big adjustment for Alejandro Lara is stay off your back. <laughs> Don't allow Joani to get you down. Man, what an exchange. Boy, she's really going after it. And the one thing that we knew, Alejandro Lara has really improved in her stand-up. And normally that was what Joani was comfortable in is the stand-up. But as we're watching right now, it appears that Alejandro Lara is actually the one landing the better shots. Lara working with the Grasso family in Mexico. Alexa Grasso known for hair striking, trained by Grasso's dad as uh, Giovanni comes forward but gets countered by Lara before Lara goes for the body lock. And despite the success Lara's had in the stand-up is wanting to close the distance and maybe try to take Jawani down. Yeah, and there she separates, and that's what you hear. In her corner right now, and what you're seeing, you want her to stay in the stand-up. She's the one that's been landing the cleaner, harder shots. She's using that reach advantage, and she's causing problems for Jawani. Laura from a southpaw stance. Jawani resetting, stutter step. Seconds gone here in the second. Both trying to solve the other puzzle as Joanne lands a right hand on the face of Lara. Lara appears to have like a smirk smile on her face, like she knows something, she knows what's coming. Well, Jawani knew coming in, she told us that 
One of Lara's biggest strengths is her ability to switch bases naturally, and she feels that Lara's weakest aspect is the ground game. Well, Jelani walked right into the shot, closed the distance, looking for the takedown. And an arm takedown. And gets it. Now, Lara in this position on her side, this is a good place for her. She does not want Joani to end up putting her flat on her back, which is exactly what Joani is doing right now. Joani two for two in the takedown department. Working the body of Lara. Lara con trying to just control Joani, not allow her to improve her position. Joani out striking Lara two to one in total strikes according to our stats as she lands another off kick from Lara. Nice pass by Joani. Out of half guard into side control. Ninety seconds left in the middle frame. Joani trying to pass guard, but it's in the open half guard of Lara, and Lara trying to well, momentarily hip escape, but she definitely has to do more and not settle for this position. Easier said than done when you have someone like Joani on you. Joani's got you know good pressure. You see her figure fouring the one leg. She's trying to hold that hip down. Not trying to do any damage right now, more of just controlling. You see Lara trying to just get the elbows in, do anything she can to, to cause a problem. But Joani having good hip control, a lot of, lot of pressure, heavy hips. That's making it very difficult for Alejandra Lara to move her. Joani began training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the age of 17. She's a purple belt and went looking for Submission in round one, but here with 30 seconds now left in the second round. She controls from top position, but rubber guard there employed by Laura. And really, Laura unable to do much from her back with time running out in the round. That's got oh. the full guard. Oh, that's on the ground. And it was on the ground, John. Of course, leave it to the referee to notice it right away. Listen, listen, listen. Hey, turn around. You got up kicked right in the face when you were on your knees. Stay here, okay? Stay here. You should go right over here, Tom. Okay, just stay over there. Is the uh, translator? I just need to know, is she okay? She got kicked in the face while she was down. Here you see the guard and you see the kick. She's on her yeah. knees. You good? Kick okay. comes across the face. That's illegal. You cannot kick the head or face of a grounded sure, sure. fighter. Yep. Yep. Go over Both there. fighters right were grounded okay? at that time. An illegal blow. Yeah. So I'm going to take a point from her. Kevin McDonald telling you right now he's taking a point from Alejandro she was down. Lara. You kicked her in the head, so up kick is... That makes it a round where Alejandro Lara possibly could right, end up go ahead over there. losing the round by two points based on this. Okay the best continue? she can do really at this point is try to bring it back to even. You sure? At 11 do seconds, I don't doctor? think she's going to be able to do it. No? You sure? You good to fight? Yeah? Okay. Let's continue. Ready time? I like how they bring in the Let's interpreter go. and then ask all the questions after the bell. <laughs> Joani able to continue and Lauren now knows she has to look for a, a home run here. And time runs out in a second as she does land that straight right at the bell. When you do your math, after that eventful second round, John, how do you have your scorecard? Well, I think Alejandra Lara is going to have to uh, yeah. get a finish in this fight if she wants to walk away with the win. That taking of the point did not help her in any fashion. She's down.
Carla Pironista, por favor, vai. Nosso jogo é esse. Não vamos brigar com ela, porque ela vai vir para brigar com você. Não vamos poder arriscar mais, certo? Guarda alta, não vai para briga. Bate e agarra ela, certo? Se ela vir com tudo, agarra ela. Confia em seu wrestling agora, hein, cara? O jogo é esse. Ok? A atenção que ela vai vir para o striker. Não permite que ela mantenha você se segura para ela. Repite. Vamos girar, ok? Você é a campeã. Tá ouvindo? Who will snap their two fight losing streak? Number five ranked Alejandra Lara or Ilara Joani? I see what you did there. I know what you did. <laughs> Third and finally. Joani representing the Pitbull brothers. Coming out like a Pitbull. Both, both fighters. Oh, and Lara landing that elbow as Joani closing the distance with the clinch. Lara looking to take her down, but instead she ends up on her back courtesy of Joani. This is exactly where Alejandra Lara did not no. want to be the, at the start of this round. She's going to have to work hard to get herself away from Joani, get herself back to her feet so she can possibly get that knockout, get the win. Mentioned the Pitbull brothers are Tampa. The Tricky Pitbull will make his maiden voyage as lightweight champion against number one ranked contender Sidney Outlaw when we make our first visit to Tacoma, Washington on July 22nd. Bellator MMA, Pacific Northwest. Very impressed with the advancement of Joani with her ground game. She's much more comfortable. She's heavier on the ground. The positioning is better. You can tell she's really worked on this to improve. Good heavy shoulder pressure. Close guard by Laura trying to create separation. And there from posture creating the space. Now she, Joani, now she can't be right. Instead, it's a kick to the calf by Joani. Go behind by Joani. Looking to put her hooks in. Alondra Lara has been submitted once. That was via arm bar when she challenged then flyweight champion Alima Lay McFarlane at Bellator 201 back in June of 2018. Lara right now is in a position she really needs to start to move. It's not easy when you've got someone like Joani on the back. But you see her reaching her hand up, trying to control the head so she can actually posture up and spin. She's already spinning. She's going to be able to get through the guard. Now, look at her she has done that. Does she stay on the ground or does oh, she? Oh, and remember, we told Joani had that knee bar submission against Beck Rawlings. You saw how out of control she was in going after her on the ground, and that's what led her right into this position now with Joani having that leg. Lara's still in a position. There's no submission attempt right now at all. Now it's completely gone. She's got a lot of work to do. She yes, less than two problems. minutes to do it. And again, it's Joani, though, that continues to control even from her back. And critical time continues to tick away. Ilara Joani content to hold on, but Alejandra Lara needs to do something drastic and in a hurry. Lara in a position, she's, she's looking for the leg. That's not, she's not in a position to get that leg right now and to extend it. She could look towards reaching back, start to use a hammer fist to create a problem for Joani from the position she's at. Instead, it's Joani going to the body with a couple of right hands. And it will be Joani in top position. A minute left in the fight. That left leg is entwined all the way through. That's going to cause Joani a problem. She can try to hold the position, but it's going to be tough for her to advance. 
A very impressive fight overall by Yoani. When you look at what she's done with someone in on the ground, she's really proved how much she has improved in this area. She's looked fantastic. Side control now. She told us that it was going to be, yeah, in this fight that she was going to show everyone the reason why Bellator MMA signed her and that she does feel she can still get to the top. It, Looks like she's going to finish the fight in top position. And it very much looks like Jawani's the one who's going to snap a two-fight losing streak, sending Laura to her third consecutive defeat. But again, that's up to the judges. Great sign of sportsmanship between these two flyweights who go the 15-minute distance. Pretty good about her performance now. All the pressure is off. She really did perform well. Take a look at what occurred here. Multiple times gets to the takedown. You saw Laura grabbing the cage there. Did not matter. Still got her down. Then when Laura went after in the stand up, she got hit. She held her ground at times. Came back. There's some clean shots landed by Laura, but always ended up working the fight towards the ground. Here gets a takedown. Top position and just did work. Changed half guard into side control positions. Was able to put Alejandro Lara's back flat. Take a look at those stats. Big difference overall in ground control. And look at the takedowns. Three of those compared to zero. That's the big difference in this fight. Which fighter is returning to the win column? Michael C. Williams has the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, from the judges' scorecards, your first, Kerry Hatley, 30 to 26, while Marcel Varela and Doug Crosby both see it the same, 29, 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Ilara Johanni. Ilara Johanni. Doing a little dance. Hey, Alejandro Lara joining her in a spontaneous dance party as Jawani. Well, she will be the one dancing the night away as she snaps a two fight losing streak and improves to two and two here in Bellator. 10 and six overall. Alejandro Lara, former flyweight title challenger, now has lost three in a row for the first time. Tonight, her career. Let's go back to single Amanda Gates. Pretty ladies for Bellator. Thank you so much. Uh, two guys here on the desk. I'm not sure. If they're very good dancers, maybe we'll find out by the end of the night. Taking a look at the main card for Bellator 282, kicking off at 9 Eastern on Showtime tonight. Of course, the two fights there in the middle. We have the quarterfinals of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix. The main event, the champ Gegard Mousasi, the third defense of his title, going up against the guy in Johnny Eblen, fast rising star, 11 in 0. But let's talk about the first fight of the night. We have Brennan Ward going up against Cassius Kane. Uh, Rafian Lake me you are a Texan somehow you've become like an honorary corn husker here so you know Cassius Kane well he told us look this is the biggest moment of my life what do we need to know about him Man, you need to know that Cassius Kane comes to fight you know I fought on a couple shows with him back in the VFC days back in the day and he comes to fight he's a gritty fighter he might be one of the greediest fighters that I know personally and I'm excited to see him get this opportunity
Josh, talk to me about Brennan Ward, the guy he's going up against. Cassius Kane, first time. He will be in a Bellator cage. Brennan Ward, we hadn't seen him in a Bellator cage for quite some time, several years. He came back in February. He was dealing with some drug addiction, a lot of hard things. Uh, and this is going to be a second time back in. What can we expect this time around? Well, the first time he answered a lot of questions that I think that people had. He came out, performed. He was still there, but there was some rust. I want to see if those questions now are answered moving forward. Did you pick up the rust? Did you clean it up? Did you figure out how to put your combinations back together? To utilize your wrestling? All of those things still need to be answered. We're going to find that out tonight. Okay, uh, we got to talk about the next fight really quickly. We're going to kind of talk about it. We're going to show a lot of video. Uh, the stare down between Sabaho Masi and Macon Mendoza. I had stepped out of the room. Rafion, you were there when all of a sudden some sort of chaos broke out. What the heck happened, man? Okay, I'm going to give you the play by play right now. Okay, so Mendoza, he head butted Hamasi a little bit. Okay, then Hamasi pushed him. Then I was like, I was on live and I was like, oh, snap, stuff is going down. I didn't know what was going on. And then after this incident, they again, uh, Hamasi said something to him, I believe in Portuguese, called him some kind of something that starts with a P word. I won't say it on camera. You almost got me. But almost, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then they, they, they went at it again. So this is real heat. This is real, you know, a real fight. And uh, it's going to be real exciting. Uh, play by play. Did he just take Moro's job? <laughs> like, is he <laughs> really well? that. I'm not sure, Moro Ronaldo. Uh, you may have someone coming after you, sir. Yeah, I better mind my P's and Q's. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, um, all right, everybody. We are set for more action. Well, these guys didn't mind their P's and Q's of the way, and that's for sure. Sabah Hamasi, he is ranked at number 10 in his division, and of course, we've got Macon Mendoza, who is, well, turning 32 July 12th, and Hamasi lives and dies by the sword, and hey, pulling out a few uh, submission wrinkles as well. Hey, both of them, their last opponent was Jaleel Willis and Sabah Hamasi put on a beautiful performance, an arm triangle choke, made it tight. Just a nice, nice submission win from a guy that we know has a ton of power in his hands, but he can do it both ways. All right, let's go to the tail of the tape for what should be a hard-hitting affair between, well, the ultra-scrappy Sabaho Masi, ranked number 10 at 170, and Macon Mendonca, who, again, looking to bounce back from a loss to the guy who, Hamasi being his last fight, the aforementioned Jaleel Willis. Here is Michael C. Williams. Tonight here, Bellator 282, the prelims continue now with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first, the blue corner. At six foot two, weighing in 170 and three quarter pounds. His professional record, 11 wins, five losses from Rio das Oestras, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Presenting Maicon, born again, Mendonça. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 170 pounds, even as a professional. 16 victories, 10 defeats. He fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida, presenting Sapa, the sleek, chic Homasi. In charge, your referee, Kerry Hatley. Sabah Homasi's made it clear he wants Macon Mendonca to meet him in the center of the cage. He's won five of his last seven. Mendonca's won five right, of his last four, four. six. Ready, ready. Good work. Let the fistic fireworks begin. Omasi involved in the 2021 Bellator MMA Fight of the Year against Paul Daly may have lost that fight, but what an epic battle that was. And you know Omasi always wants to make it memorable in the game. He wants to make it nasty. Look, he's already talking to him. It, it, the real difference in the stand-up here. Mendoza is a good technical stand-up fighter. He's got range. He lands good combinations. Homasi's got power. Homasi can end it with one shot. He knows that. He's just looking for that shot. Homasi has six wins via first round a knockout. Ten of his 16 victories have come thanks to his power. And Mendoza tasting that power. Mendoza looking to clinch. Oh! Talking about Omasi 
he has one punch knockout power. He just showed you how it's done. He believes in his power, and it is real. Take a look at this shot. Right hand misses, left hand comes over it. But he gets a, just a little bit of space. And when he gets the space, that right hand just up uh, you can see. Mendoza has no idea where he's at. Left hand touches, but here comes the space. Now the right hand. Bink! Right on the jawline. The Dude. sleek chic with a heat-seeking missile, John. What a knockout. The way Mendonca went near the canvas. Face first. Yeah, when someone goes down, face forward. Take a look at this real speed. Here it comes, a little separation. Right hand. Oh. Oh. Beautiful job by Sabah Masi. Crushing power on full visceral display. Fuck the yeah. reaction from <laughs> American <laughs> Top Team. Yeah, that's that's worthy of an F We're going back too. in. We're going back in. Wow. After a performance like that, his future is so bright, he's got to wear Let's shades, go, man. Baby. Wow. Sabaho Bossi. Make that seven wins via first round knockout. And for a despondent Mekon Mendonca, he suffers his second consecutive defeat. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end suddenly. 58 seconds round, number one, the winner by knockout, the sleep, Sheik Sabah Hamasi. Gone in less than 60 seconds, a 58-second knockout win for Hamasi. Hey, go, he has a 17-second KO Where's of Mika Terrell at Bellator 225, and so... He, again, lives by it, ties by it, and tonight it was Macon Mendonco felt the power of Sabaho Masi. Let's go back to Amanda Guerra. More right before that fight, we saw the drama that unfolded with the stare down there. Maybe Sabaho Masi took that little head, but personally, uh, Robion, it's the first time you've been on the desk with us for a finish like that. And look at your face. God damn, God damn. He knocked him, that knocked that dude out. The sleek sheik is alive and well, man. That was amazing to watch. Joshua. <laughs> I can't follow that up. Yes, you can. You got, what do you guys want me to say? Job. He's damn, oh, job. God damn. <laughs> Big John was right, though. He needed to create a little bit of space, and he let the hands fly, just caught a perfect on the chin, and it was lights down. Uh, Y'all are real loud in my I ear know. with these reactions, <laughs> by the way. What a finish, though. We're going to have more prelim action after this. Head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Musasi is a monster. Sometimes nightmares. Oh, the dream catcher. Happen when you're wide awake. Looking to smash the dreams of the number one contender. Two-time world champ, Gegard, the dream catcher, Musasi, goes for his 50th career win. Best in my profession. But Johnny the Human Cheat Code Evelyn has all world talent. Musasi, I'm ready to take your ass out. And the attitude to match. For my skill, for my power. Bellator MMA, Musasi versus Evelyn, tonight live on Showtime. Speaking of the middleweight division, the fifth ranked Anatoly Tokov getting set to welcome Muhammad Abdullah to the Bellator MMA cage for the first time. Let's go to the tail of the tape. Big John McCarthy, take it away. I think I will on this one. The big thing right here, take a look at the record of Anatoly Tokov. This guy's got a ton of experience. Outstanding record of 30 and 2, 11 and 5 for Muhammad Abdullah. All right, I admit you did it better than I did. All right, let's go to <laughs> Michael C. Williams. 
And for those that may have just joined us at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports on YouTube, we welcome you to Mohegan Sun. Bellator 282 continues now with three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 184 pounds, 184 and a quarter pounds. He comes in at six foot even, making his Bellator debut. He brings 11 professional victories, five defeats. Muhammad the Hurricane Abdullah. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 186 pounds, even unbeaten inside the Bellator cage. His overall record stands at 30 and two. Introducing Anatoly Toko. In charge, your referee Dan Mergliata. Anatoly Tokov, 23 and one in his past 24 fights. 10 wins via first round knockout or submission. Right, Muhammad Abdullah, 11 and 5 Let's with go, one Mike. no contest, three knockouts as he well, faces a very tough test in his first fight here inside the Bellator MMA cage. Anatoly Tokov ranked at number five, heavily favored to beat Abdullah. And there, landing the kick. Well, Abdullah's best weapon is his boxing, it's his hands. It, he has a hard time keeping himself sometimes on his feet. Guys like to take him down and control him on the ground, go after the submissions. That might not be a bad plan for Tokov we just, instead, instead of getting hit. We just witnessed Sabaho Masi record a 58-second knockout. Oops. Well, he was the last man to beat Muhammad Abdullah back in November of 2018 as Abdullah looking to put together a textbook one-two combination. But Tokov, 16 of his 30 wins via form of knockout. And he immediately takes the back of Abdullah. This is not good for Abdullah. Tokov very good on the ground. Master of sports and combat Samba, world champion. He's very, very effective from this position. Good ground and pound. And we mentioned 16 knockouts. Well, he has seven submission wins, including five guillotine chokes. So loves to attack the neck, but has an opportunity to do so from the back, looking for potential rear naked choke as Abdullah. Well, he's in a world of trouble right now, getting nailed with these shots. Yeah, this is this the worst thing that could have happened was that him falling like that. He is now in a position. Tokov's got a lot of power in his hands. And he's got a great submission attack. He can go after the arm, he can go after the neck, he can go after the legs. He's good with all of those submissions. Abdullah has never been knocked out. He's not going to be able to take a whole lot more of getting hit freely like what Tokov is doing. There's a lot of power on that right hand. Tokov teeing off on Muhammad Abdullah from back position. But Abdullah trying somehow, maybe now being flattened out, and he is being tattooed by Anatoly Tokov. How much more will the referee allow Muhammad Abdullah to absorb? He is not even attempting to defend. And it's over. Anatoly Tokov dispatches Muhammad Abdullah, making it look easy as he improves to 31 and 2. He is a perfect 7 and 0 in Bellator MMA and that is knockout number 17 and you know he is going to be watching with vested interest when Gegard Mousasi defends the title against Johnny Eblin later tonight in our main event. Yeah, absolutely, you look at the, that's the kind of fight. He has no idea he won. He thought it was the end of the round. Wow. <laughs> Watch the slip right here. This was the beginning and end. That kick right there. Abdullah ends up on his butt. Tokov immediately takes the back. And from that point, there was just no recovery for Muhammad Abdullah. He just took a lot of shots. He tried to build his base up. He was unable to stop the attack of Anatoly Tokov. Tokov now, as you said, 31 and 2 as a professional. The guy is a stud and took no damage at all in this fight. Nikita Mikhailov there in his corner. 
And Abdullah thinking about why did I throw that kick? Tokov representing Fedor team, of course, under the tutelage of the all time great Fedor Emelianenko. Trains with the likes of his brother. <laughs> Valentin Moldovsky, Vadim and Viktor Nemkov. A formidable bunch out of Stario Skull, Russia. And maybe perhaps not better right now than Anatoly Tokov. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Dan Mergliata steps in, waves off the contest due to unanswered strikes. Your official time, two minutes, 28 seconds. Round number one, the winner by TKO Anatoly. From wanting to become a fighter after watching Jean-Claude Van Damme and Jackie Chan movies, Anatoly Tokov, well, he is definitely ready for his close-up here in Bellator MMA now. A perfect 7 and 0. Oh. Hello once again, Amanda. Hey, Mauro, what a night so far going through these prelims. Getting you ready for our next one here, and we want to show you these rankings because we have number two going up against number six, Kat Zingano versus Pam Bam Sorensen. And Josh, I want to start with you because if Kat wins this, there is a chance she could be going up against the champion Chris Cyborg. What would you like to see from her next? I'd like to see her win so she can get that fight against Chris Cyborg. When she signed with Bellator, that was the biggest talk. I'm coming after Chris Cyborg. There's been moments where she just hasn't been active for some reason. No one knows why, but she hasn't been active. She is now on track. She said, I feel good. Everything feels healthy. What does she got to do? Man, I think she's just got to be Kat Zagano. You know, she's going to fight the way she's going to fight. She's a good wrestler, heavy wrestler, good top pressure, and she's going to bring the fight. You know, that's how she comes to fight. That's what, what she did for so many years, and I think that's what she's going to do tonight. Rafion brought up the wrestling with Kat. So Pam Sorensen, look, we know she's a dog. She's not going to give up. But how does she try to go against that wrestling from Kat? She's got to use her lateral movement. She can't stand directly in front of her and expect to throw punches without being taken down. She's got to move, use her lateral movement left to right, throw off the combinations or off the movement, I mean, throw her combinations off that movement. If she does that, she may have a chance to avoid a couple takedowns. If she can stuff a couple of Casingano's takedowns and make her start guessing and start guessing and thinking about what she needs to do, then I think that'll open up a lot more. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel the same way. I feel one thing to note is pa uh, Pam Swarmson is kind of short. You know, she got a low center of gravity. So I feel like that's going to pay, you know, for getting under and staying under somebody, you know, uh, going forward and defending takedown. Number two versus number six in the rankings. We know Chris Cyborg has her eye on this fight tonight. Mora, back down to you. The entire fight world has their eyes on this fight tonight because, yeah, it does have uh, ramifications in the featherweight division. Kat Zingano against Pam Bam Sorensen. Zingano ranked number two, Sorensen ranked number six. With the 4 1 1, here's Mr. Big John McCarthy. As Mr. Stotts just said, Pam Sorensen is not that tall. But look at the reach advantage 68 to 63.5. We'll see if that makes a difference for Kat Zingano. Here is Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Mohegan Sun, Bellator 282 continues now with three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at five foot six, weighing in 146 pounds at a number six ranking. Her professional record: nine wins, four losses from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Pam Bam Sorensen. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 145 and one half pounds as the number two ranked featherweight. She stands with 12 professional victories, four defeats by way of Boulder, Colorado. She fights out of San Diego, California, Alpha Cat Zingano. And your referee in charge once again, Dan Mergliata. Katz and Gatto turns 40 <laughs> next month. She is two and one since moving up to the featherweight division in December of 2018. Perfect two and zero oh here right. in Bellator right, MMA. Man. The former Not Invicta ready. FC Let's featherweight champion Pam Sorensen. She's one and one inside the Bellator MMA cage, coming off a loss to two-time title challenger Arlene Blanco, blocking that left head kick by Zingano. Zingano shoots in for the takedown and scores it. Well, that is exactly what I thought Katzengano would want to do. Katzengano is 
probably one of the best wrestlers, pure wrestlers that you will see in the featherweight division. She has a distinct advantage over a lot of the ladies in that division. So why not use it, put the fight on the mat, and go to your ground and pound and work. When she was, when she saw wrestling for the first time at the age of 12, she immediately wanted to do it. She says it was a very healthy thing for her to find at a young age. She did go on to become an NCAA Division III wrestling champion, using her wrestling pedigree to score the early takedown, and now looking to, well, score points on the ground. She has four submission wins with five knockouts, but uh, again, came into Bellator MMA as the fight desk crew talked about as a potential challenger for Chris Cyborg has had injury problems and so and that's the big part the injuries have been a problem and that that comes with all the years of training MMA and you know you've got to be smart in slowing down getting more rest all of those things as you get older those things can add up but right now cat looking really good and opening up a oh. cut on the right eye above the right eye of Pat Sorensen Zingano Holds notable wins over the likes of Amanda Nunes and Misha Tate and bloodying up Pam Sorensen early in round one. Sorensen looking to try to get back to her feet, but instead oh. down oh. the knee was down just about to say, John. And referee Dan Mergliotta stopping the fight as an illegal knee was delivered by Katsikana. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at it Hold thinking, on. oh, she understands she's not going to throw it, and then all of a sudden, boom, she throws it. Her now, knee was on the ground, sure and of course, Dan's I'm taking a hit. Uh, no, it, it tagged her good. And she is definitely a grounded fighter. Want me to bring a doctor to take a look at you? Or are you okay. You got time. I'll give you a doctor to let you look at you. Hmm? Okay. Hey, doc. Let him take a look at you, all right? Cat. The hand and the knee was on the ground, and it closed down. I'm taking a point. One point. One point. All right, remember, on the ground, you can't do that, all right, please. The crowd not liking Dan with a lot of it. Well, he took he a point, but he did the right thing. The right thing. Okay. And here's, well, by the way, what cut her, okay. John, earlier in the fight. All right. What cut Sorensen. Time keeper, you ready? All right, Slashing. please be careful now, all right? Ready? Okay, fight! Slashing the right hand over the top, which is unusual. That was a right hand that ends up cutting on the opposite side. Speaking of slash and flick, swords, it looks like an extra from well, I know what she did last summer as she engages here again, but it's Zingano looking for the takedown, knowing that she's now had a point deducted and immediately scores her second takedown Beautiful on take Sorensen. Kat Zingano sitting out on that. Beautiful job of getting Sorensen right back onto the ground. Now knows she's at a deficit in the round. One thing right now, you see her left arm is trapped in the guard. She's going to have to wiggle that free. Approaching the midway point of the opening round. Eventful already. Zingano with two takedowns, but had a point deducted for an illegal knee strike. Pam Sorensen is a, a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so she's comfortable on the ground right now in guard, but this isn't a great place for her to try to win the fight. She wants to be in the top position or on her feet. She's turned into a good stand-up fighter. She'll take shots to give shots, even though she does have a deficit in that reach. She's willing to exchange with anybody. She just cannot be on her back like this with Kat. This is not the place for her to win this fight. Gano told us that fans can expect to see every martial art used, a, a bit of everything. She feels her experience, speed, drive, and arsenal of weapons will prove to be her victorious advantages, and she is controlling Sorensen now from the closed guard. Now Sorensen momentarily opens the guard and closes it again, but it's all Katz and Gano. It is all Katz and Gano right now. Cat needs to start in this position right here. She's landing the little shots. That head position, as her head comes even with Pam's, that's when she's going to be able to land with more power. The more she can posture, the more separation she can get, the more power she can bring. One minute, Kat. Nice right hand to the body by 
Zingano making that investment even in, on the ground, hoping to break the grip of Sorensen. See it right now, take a look at Pam Sorensen going into that body lock with the figure four. That is like the worst thing you can do. All you're doing is locking yourself yeah. on your opponent. You're locking yourself out of the car. It's it's uh, it's interesting though for Zingano, who's playing it tight to the the chest. He can, can you know do more damage by posturing up, but it's short strikes just mauling Sorensen. That's winning as far as you know the the damage difference and who's taking the shots. That's not taking much. Oh, wow. Open palm strikes are not going to do any damage to it. We know she does not want you to stand, Pam. If you're looking for that right hand, she comes in, throw the right elbow or throw the right uppercut, she's gonna shoot right away. Need some water? On the bottom, we gotta get our feet on her hips, we gotta get off there. This is the start of the round, and you saw Kat right away going for that takedown. Takedowns yep. two in a row for her in this round. There's two Here's cuts the on Pam Sorensen, one over the right yeah. eye and one right in. above that, elbow. that left Throw eye that straight knee. up and down, but that knee was the, the difference. It's, Point taken. It's not Marvin Eastman-esque, but it's still pretty nasty. <laughs> no, it's definitely not Marvin Eastman. <laughs> Remember Joe Rogan? Oh, yes. Yeah. I could say it, but I won't. <laughs> There's only one. All right, well, for Pam Sorensen, obviously wants right, to stay two, ladies, on. Let's go. Fight. Her feet against Katzengano, who scored two takedowns, but had the point deducted, John, and how that it impact your scorecard? Uh, so with that point deduction, that's a 9-9 round. You give 10 points to Kat, take one away, we have an even round. Half kick by Alpha Katzengano, and a head kick by Zingano. So again, told us she was going to show everything and definitely looking to put that on display. Another head kick. And that blood continues to trickle down the side of Sorensen's face. Kat's doing a nice job, giving some feints. She's starting to, the feints that she's giving is freezing Pam Sorensen, and that's what's leading to those takedowns the way she's getting them. Now three for four in the takedown department, and speaking of numbers, a huge that. advantage for Zingano in terms of total strikes. And 86% compared to 38. Oh, yeah. 86%. You know, the uh, stand-up uh, sports and boxing, you can do 50%. It's a good Fantastic. night at the offense. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's more ways to strike, I understand. But still, what a ridiculous percentage for Zingato. And you can, you cannot in any way take a look and say, well, why isn't Kat just standing on the feet more? She, you know, she's landing those strikes. Although, this is the safe route for her to victory, and she is doing damage. And okay, and speaking of which, though, you were content with what she's doing here in terms of the keeping it close to the chest and not creating posture and doing more damage or improving position. I would love to see her create some posture in this, but give it time like that when she traps the arm there, just like you're seeing what people sometimes they, they want the fighter to put themselves into danger. Of course we do. That's, that's not what the fighter's there for. The fighter's there to I do. do damage without being damaged. That's a smart fighter, and that's what Kat Zingano is being right. Absolutely. Putting on an alpha cat performance thus far, the number two ranked fighter who has designs on, again, she's knocked off the likes of Amanda Nunes, Misha Tate, and would love to knock off Pam Sorensen here tonight and perhaps set up a potential title fight with the current featherweight champion, Chris Cyborg. Jack continually looking to trap that arm, bring the knee in over the right arm, land the left hand. She's just doing a beautiful job of controlling position, doing damage when she can, landing hard shots. This is MMA. This is her doing what she does best. Yeah, she morphed into an MMA career through the jiu-jitsu journey she shared with her late husband, Mauricio, who was also her BJJ coach. He passed away in 2014, but 
know he would be proud of what she has accomplished in her mixed martial arts career. And again, I, I know, you know, on the verge of turning the big 4-0 and still competing at the highest level. Absolutely, and you take a look at her career. She's had some hard times, and yes. she, she's had some moments where you, you know, she's had great fights. She beats Amanda Nunez. She gets the championship fight against Ronda Rousey. And you know, she takes the chance and she gets caught in an arm bar that most people will never ever be able to pull off. So she is a fantastic fighter and it's a lot of it is confidence because I think for a little bit in her career she started to lose that confidence and now it's back. Meanwhile she's continuing to try to beat the confidence out of Pam Sorensen <laughs> and for Sorensen I mean you set it up John that's why I said it the way I did it. You can't settle for this position, but I don't know if she has a choice right now. Yeah, I, I, but take a look again. She's going back to that figure four, and you look and you go, there's no way in the world you can get a submission out of that. So all you can do is accept damage here. What you're trying to do, what you're really saying is, I can't stop what she's doing, so I'm just trying to slow it down and survive. A minute left in the second round. Zingano's corner calling for elbow strikes as Sorensen working from the close guard but against the fence. Final half minute of the middle frame. And you can see right there, Pam Sorensen is trying to change the angle. She's trying to turn her hips. She's trying to create an angle where she can go after the submission. It's, she's just unable to upset the balance point that Kat Zingano has. Sorensen told us that her biggest advantage in this fight is was going to be her Muay Thai. Well, you don't get to uh, employ your Muay Thai from the ground position as we go to the third and final round. Right. All strikes, good job. So it's the wrestling of Alpha Kat Zingano, the pressure, the fight IQ, the, the experience, just like she said, John. She's delivering on her promises. We got one more but round, Pam. We gotta oh, work. Let's listen into the corners. Hey, Kat, same thing. You got her broken, okay? Yeah. No need to force anything here, Pat. If you see an opening, take it, but you don't need to force anything, all right? Just strategically. So, you take those openings when they're open. You got it, John X. She's gonna kick and shoot every time. Kick and shoot, so look out for that. Let's do it, Pam. We have to push. Cutman earning their keep in the Pam Bam Sorensen corner tonight. Sorensen hopes to stop the bleeding in a variety of ways here in the third and final round. She will need a to mount a dramatic All right, comeback. Final round. You, ready? you ready? Let's go, ladies, fight. What we believe is happening in this fight. Alpha Cat Zingano, coached by Judo Olympics team coach Justin Flores, and she is utilizing kicks here to kick off round three and setting up the takedown. This ball by Sorensen, but now it's again Zingano. Pressure, pressure, pressure always on the attack. And she has Pam Sorensen on her heels. Every time she takes a step forward, you look at what Pam is doing. She's getting concerned about that takedown, and you can't blame her. Oh, my time came off. Oh, very close right. again. Yeah, very close. Out of bend. Cat needs to be very careful when she's going to utilize that knee strike. Yeah, adding insult to injury with the Muay Thai plum against the Muay Thai practitioner who thought her stand-up would be her biggest advantage. Unable to get on track against Zingano, always threatening with the takedown. And Zingano in that, you know, she she did throw that knee, but Pam Sorensen was getting herself up. I have it on my ISO right there. Oh, it's a legal so it was legal. Zingano picking off Sorensen with kicks, keeping her at distance. Nairs the takedown attempt, and she secures it. 
Murphy. And right there, that's what Pat is so good at with her wrestling is she understands the positioning, so she'll come into her opponent. Instead of trying to drive through him, she'll drop through, making her opponent actually go over the top of her. She ends up in the top position. Outstanding wrestling by Katzenkopf. A dominant display, statistically speaking, by Alpha Katzengano, <coughs> who has recorded four takedowns in seven attempts. And how about these numbers, John? Right now, Katzengano has landed 134 of 161 strikes compared to 18 of 46 for Sorensen. They need to add three more under there. <laughs> wow. It, look, it, in this position, it is, you know, abundantly clear Pam Sorensen cannot get Katzengano off of her. Kat has been able to move, control, put damage on her. She's now again back in the guard, but Pam Sorensen is holding her in that position, so she's not going to go anywhere, so the time's just going to move on while Cat lands shots. As we come up on the final, or the midway point of the final round, Zingano, who is 2-0 in Bellator, coming off that armbar submission win over Olivia Parker in April of last year, wanting to put the finishing touches on this one-sided affair against Pam Sorensen, and of course, looking for a title shot. Well, as you recall, in Katzengano's first fight in Bellator, she fought Gabrielle Holloway and ended up in bad positions at times. She got mounted. She took some abuse. You take a look, she's fighting smarter, she's fighting better. Pam Sorensen's a very solid, good, tough fighter, Invicta champion. Katzengano is just, you know, doing the things to give her the advantage. That's a beautiful move right in the half guard right there. Yeah, Zingano knows the stakes. Even if the uh, crowd would like to see maybe a little more sizzle, but a, a very effective display by Alpha Katzengano utilizing the techniques that are necessary, her strengths, and uh, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves in this case. Numbers don't always tell the story. Boy, do they ever tell a horror story for Pam Sorensen here tonight, as does her face. And then you take a look, Pam Sorensen finally realized that I've got to get out, so she has to get position. Pat now, in a, Pam now in a position where Cat is taking the back, Zingano. She's got that 100% hold, of almost a, a half Nelson from where she's at. Final minute. Sorensen really needs to get back to her feet. Watch those knees on her way up. There you go. Here we go. Good. Good Zingano inside control. Knee now. There's a knee to the body. Another knee by Zingano. Coming up on the final 30 seconds. Alpha Cat Zingano feasting on Ham. Bam Sorensen was cut early, suffered multiple cuts, and was taken down a total of four times and unable to get anything going against the number two ranked Alpha Cat Zingano, who is well on her way to earning that title shot. So John, your takeaways from what you just saw, sir. I'm going to tell you, I thought Katzengano fought a very intelligent fight. She fought a fight that she wasn't going to take a lot of damage in. Why stand up with someone like Pam Sorensen when she wants to be that, you know, striker? Let me take her out of her element. I'm going to put her on the ground where I believe I'm stronger, I'm better. That's what she did. She beat her up there. That is a great fight by Katzengano. Not every fight is Homasi like. <laughs> She might have an injury there because she is having a hard time standing right now. There you saw that beautiful step behind by Katzengano sweeping the leg. The ground and pound was beautiful throughout the fight. This is in the third round when Sorensen was trying 
to do something to get out right at the end of the fight. Knees to the rib cage. None of those feel good. All solid strikes. Take a look at those fight stats. Morrow, wow. we're talking about just domination. 12 minutes, almost 12 and a half minutes to zero as far as ground control. 184 strikes landed to 23. There's your difference. Those four takedowns. Sorensen could not stop Singano from taking her to the ground. Might be the another injury. An injury that will stop Kat Singano. Unfortunately, let's a knee. She's pointing to her knee. Man. This is what happens in fighting. Even when you win, sometimes you don't walk away untouched. All right. John McCarthy feels she's done enough to win. Let's see if Michael C. Williams agrees with the announcement of the winner. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges. First, Marcel Varela scores the fight 29 to 26, while judges Brian Miner and Doug Crosby both see it the same 29 27. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Alpha Cat Zingano. Well, let's hope it doesn't turn into a Pyrrhic victory for Cat Zingano, who has improved to 13 and 4. And now a perfect 3-0 here in Bellator MMA, dominating Pam Bam Sorensen on her way to a unanimous decision victory and potentially setting up a championship fight with Chris Cyborg, although this does not look good. Let's go back to Amanda Guerra. Oh. And that definitely doesn't look good. Yeah, that, that was a painful thing to toss back to tomorrow. Uh, let's take a look, though. We have an electric fight coming up next. Taking a look at our lightweight rankings here now. We don't play favorites, but I will say for Josh, this is one of his favorite fights of the night. Brent Premis, number two, going up against Alexander Shopley at number eight. I want to start with Brent Premis here. And Rafi, I actually want to start with you. Look, he's known for his heavy leg kicks. He's got great jujitsu. What are you looking to see from Brent Premis tonight? Exactly. I, when I think of Brent Premis, I think powerhouse with good jujitsu. And that's what I'm looking to see tonight. I'm excited for him. He just got to implement his will. He's got to push, try to push Shavli around. He cannot get caught up chasing submissions from the bottom. He is a beast. He is a big body lightweight. He needs to make sure that he ends up on top, make Shavli carry the weight, and attack the submissions. Josh, let's talk about Shavli here. You have trained with him several times. Josh uh, actually told me that Shavli is a better boxer than him. I know that was very big of you to say. Uh, what do you want to see from him? You just had to rub that in, didn't you? I did. I said you know. that in confidence. I said that. <laughs> nothing, nothing is confident on the fight desk. Oh, you want to pull my, that knife out of my back? Get I got that knife out of my back. There. I got you. Look, he is fantastic. He's a great fighter. He's I've trained with him for months. He is really good with his boxing, tight, great leg kicks, got good anti-wrestling, but he's also very good with submissions. He's got seven submissions under his name, 10 KOs because he's got great boxing, 21 and three record. He comes from, he has that style, that Sambo style of just foot sweeps, wrestling, mixing it all up. You gotta remember, when these guys come over and they have they've competed so long in Sambo, they've got probably close to 200 fights in Sambo. They come here, MMA is just an add-on to them. He has enough experience to, to take apart Brent Primus. Look, you're a two-time world champ for a reason. We love you. Uh, we just gotta rub it in sometimes. Moro, back to you. All right, we are getting set for more preliminary action here at Bellator 282. And hey, it features a former Bellator lightweight champion in Brent Primus, currently ranked number two at 155. He takes on the number eight ranked Alexander Shabli, who is 2-0 in the Bellator MMA cage. Take it away, Big John. Very simply put, 11-2 against 21-3. Both these guys are outstanding lightweights. Everywhere else they match up very well. This is going to be an outstanding fight. Here is Michael C. Williams. And for those staying up late night, joining us live in the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you. Bellator 282 now goes three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner, at 5'9", weighing in 155 and three-quarter pounds, ranked at number eight. His professional record, 21 wins, three losses, presenting Alexander Shapley. 
across the cage's adversary out of the red corner. At 5'10", weighing in 156 pounds, even ranked number two. The former Bellator lightweight world champion as a professional brings 11 victories, two defeats, introducing Brett. Charge your referee, Mark Goddard. Mouth watering matchup here in the lightweight division. Brent Primus, former champ, has won three of his last four fights, coming off a big win over Benson Henderson, Alexander Shopley. He's won six in a row. And he has, well, he's known for power, but also that interesting ground game. No matter which department you break this fight down in, both of them can prove to be a little dangerous, John. Both of them are dangerous in different areas, but that, what you just saw, Primus coming out, that low calf kick, he's got a lot of power in that low calf kick, and he needs to, at, when he can, attack that front lead leg of Shabli to slow down Shabli and make it to where it's tough for him to land with power. And Primus loves to get off to a fast start. All eight of his wins by knockout or submission have come in the first round. Shabli has gone the distance in his last four fights. Nice. Again, riding a six-fight win streak as uh, good kicks being exchanged. Beautiful counter kick by Shabli there. Double jab, right hand through the guard by Primus, backing Shabli up, forcing him to reset. Lead right hook curl behind the guard in the left hand, and a left kick by Primus momentarily rattles Shabli. If you're looking at this fight and you're looking at this matchup, Primus has got power in his hands, but technique-wise, and being the technician in the stand-up, Shabli is a guy that can piece you up on the ground. Primus is a monster. He is outstanding, especially if he gets to the top position off of his back. He's great. A lot of guys aren't good off the back. Primus is. Neither Primus or Shabli have been knocked out in their respective careers. 90 seconds elapsed here in the first round as Primus again looking to put the pressure on Shabli momentarily coming forward. Caught with the jab, lands the left and closes the gap into the clinch. Now Shabli went down there, but that was not from a shot. That was just a slip as he's backing away. But it allowed Mr. Primus, Primus to, to get into this position. The real, and the real thing here is Shabli's wrestling is good. He's an outstanding defensive wrestler. He's very difficult to take down. And he will use a lot of trips and sweeps to get you on your back. back up to his feet. Shabli being very smart there. He, he understands Primus is dangerous off his back. Why am I going to go to the ground with this guy when I think, in my opinion, I can stand up with him and technically pick him apart. Veteran trainer Colin Oyama in Primus corner. Worked with Clinton Rampage Jackson back in the day, amongst others. And for Shabli, well, he is Worked with the likes of American Top Team, and man, you talk about iron sharpening iron there, the likes of Harry Masvidal, Dustin Poirier, et al. Two minutes left in the first. Shabli, lying at fainting, trying to get Primus to commit. Trying to get Primus to fight so Shabli can counter. And oh, Primus. Exactly what you're saying is Shabli is looking to have Primus bite on one of the feints so he can counter. But if there's one thing that you're seeing, Primus came out very aggressive, was landing shots. He has really slowed down how many shots he's throwing there because he is getting countered. And he got knocked out. Exactly. And in terms of the striking department, it's it's close in terms of the official stats right now with Shabli scoring 11 strikes and landing there where Primus was credited with 10. So still very competitive as we expected. The numbers there with uh, Shabli having a higher percentage rate of connecting, including with that left hand. But both of them right now landing 11. But the big difference in that, that 11 is Shabli did have a knockdown. Yeah. Not that he really hurt Primus, but he did put him on his butt. Final minute as Shabli blocked that left head kick from Primus. 
There's Shabley steps in with a lead right before backing up. There's another lead left hook that landed upstairs for Shabley. And the spinning attack by Primus. Ineffective. But a lot of these are missing right now yep. for Primus. That range is causing him a problem. But for Shabley, he's found the range. That was not Primus getting knocked down with the shot. That was the catch of his leg. It caused him to end up on his butt. Weak combination from Shabley as expected. Highly technical affair between these top ranked lightweights. What did you like more in that first five minutes? Yeah, you gotta look at both guys. Primus came out really strong. That low leg kick, that calf kick was good. But you got to go with Shabley was the one that landed overall the better, cleaner strikes. He did put Primus down. Take a look at some of what occurred here. There's that nice clean kick, the catch of the leg and the right hand straight. Here comes the second time that it happened. Right hand kind of missed, but a beautiful job of ending it with that kick to the back of the hamstring. Very nice. Clean technique by Alexander Shabu. He's got a good coach there with Art and Levin as his uh, striking coach. Not bad. Mm. Tremendous kickboxer. I always remember calling this great fight with uh, Joe Schilling, although he'd rather I forget, I'm sure, Artem Levin. A huge win for Joe Schilling in Los Angeles back in the day. Joe Schilling, of course, a seen action in the Bellator MMA cage as we resume action here in round number two. Three punch combination by Shabri. And Again, very calm in his attack. It's not the nervous energy that seems to be coursing through the veins of Primus. Exactly. Well, you see, Primus just looks Although, tighter. Yeah, but he's, he is landing these shots on Chopley, but Chopley also having some uh, success countering. And yeah, Primus looking to head fake. Again, catching the leg. Beautiful ending of it with that kick to the back of the hamstring. Just clean technique by Shabli. That's why he took the step back, just to give himself a second to let himself. In. And Shabley countering with the right hand, dropping. Brett Primus ground and pound by Shabley, and he finishes Brett Primus. Alexander Shabley with his 11th knockout victory, and he has just stopped a former Bellator lightweight champion, and he immediately rushes out of the cage to celebrate what is by far the biggest win of his career. It all started with that shot that I said that stung him. You could see it. You saw Brent Primus take some steps back and trying to collect himself. He was unable to get that done. Right hand right there at the temple, left hook. That stung, and you can see him. Take a look at him. He gives a little ground. That's, that's good. It's a smart move by Primus, but he was unable to collect himself completely. Shabley knew he had him hurt and then went after him, puts him down, and finishes it with big strikes. Puts him unconscious. Beautiful win by Shabley in the first knockout loss ever for Brent Primus. That's a clean right hand right there. That's what puts him down, and he finishes him off. Big time shots. When you're hurt, it only takes one more. That just puts him unconscious. Shabley and Khan. You know what that means. I know what that means, too. As American top team and Shabley's corner celebrating, 
a scintillating victory. Had gone the distance in his last four wins, but man, closes the show in impressive fashion by vanquishing a former champion in Brett Primus. We have just seen the number eight ranked Shabley knock out the number two ranked Primus. Absolutely, and that's why you, that's why our man Josh Thompson up at the desk had problems boxing with Shabley. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. One minute, 22 seconds into round number two. The winner by knockout, Alexander Shabley. Alexander Shabley with plenty of reasons to celebrate. What a victory, and he is moving on in the Bellator lightweight rankings. Let's go back to Amanda Guerra. Number eight defeats number two, but my favorite line there from Big John, of course, it was the boxing, and that's exactly what Josh Thompson had issues with when it came to training with Alexander Shelby. You feel a little bit betrayed right now, huh? No, no, I, I can expect a little betrayal from you up here, but Big John, my man, really? You did me dirty, buddy. You did me dirty. <laughs> That is exactly what Alexander Shabley did to Brent Primus. You were cage side. Talk to us about what you saw. So, uh, the boxing was exactly what I thought it was going to be, but I also noticed that off of the kicks, Brent Primus didn't make the adjustments. He kept throwing that body kick, and Shabley kept catching the kick, throwing the straight left or the straight right off of it, and then kicking the back leg, putting it to the ground. He had a great game plan, sprawl and brawl, but also stay in that boxing range. He did a great job. Yeah, I mean, I can see why he was touching you up, man. The guy is smooth, bro. The guy is smooth. Now you? I know, yeah, I'm going to stab you a little bit, too. The guy is so smooth. His striking is, you know, and it seems so effortless. It looked like he was chewing gum out there. It was beauty to watch. Look, uh, we're about to be on showtime. Maybe we'll clean it up a little bit when we get there. All right, we have a full night ahead of us here at Bellator 282, including our main event, the legend in Gegard Mousasi. And the guy, this will be his 12th fight of his career, looking to take his crown. Musashi said he didn't know who the fuck I was. Johnny Evelyn. I'm right here, dog. I'm ready to take your ass out. Johnny Evelyn electrifying in the Bellator MMA cage. I want to see you in this goddamn cage, dog. Let's go. Let's gear up and let's get after it. But tonight, it's all about Gegard Musashi, the Bellator MMA middleweight champion. He can fight with anybody, anywhere. He's conquered almost every promotion he has competed in. He is the best. Make no mistake. Musashi ground and pound. Musashi maintains the Bellator MMA Middleweight Championship. Main event coming up later tonight at Bellator 282 on a Showtime. Musasi defending the title against the undefeated Johnny Eblen. Musasi knocking on the door of history. A golden milestone. 50 wins in his sights as we get set for more preliminary action. And boy, looking forward to this one as well in the featherweight division. Submission magician, second generation mixed martial artist Lucas Brennan undefeated against Johnny Soto. One and one in the Bellator cage. What do the numbers tell you, John? Look at 6-0 and oh at 20 two years of age he's a young prodigy four and two for a very tough Johnny Soto who likes to fight on the ground I just don't know if he should do that with Lucas Brennan let's go to Michael C Williams ladies and gentlemen tonight here at Mohegan Sun our prelims go now to three five minute rounds in the featherweight division introducing the blue corner at five foot nine weighing in 145 and one half pounds his professional record four wins two losses fighting out of Escondido California presenting Johnny Phantom Soto and across the cage his adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten weighing in 145 and three quarter pounds as a professional he's undefeated at six and oh fighting out of Frisco Texas introducing Lucas Skywalker Charge Kevin McDonald. Lucas Brennan, as creative and slick as it gets when it comes to the ground game, 
for his opponent, Johnny Soto. Ready to fight? Well, he is Ready hoping to, Let's go. to hand Brennan his first loss as the bell goes. And again, John, you look at Lucas Brennan, 22 years of age. All he's done in the Bellator MMA cage, the first forearm choke in organizational history. He's pulled off an anaconda choke. And in his last fight against Ben Lugo, pulled off a, a version of the assassin choke. <laughs> Lucas Brennan, when he gets into this clinch range, look out, this kid is so talented. Guys think that they're gonna be able to do things with him. His balance point is fantastic. His transitions are unbelievable. He sees things that they don't. So, danger, danger, danger. In the opening that minute. With him. Already having secured a takedown. Soto did get back to his feet. But Brennan back and immediately attacking the next. All right, he's gonna drag him down with that. Looking for the anaconda right now. He just, he let go of the one. He's trying to pull the arm. See if he can set it up a little bit deeper. Nice job by Johnny Soto, he's defending well. Grabbing the fence, and that leads to another takedown for Lucas Brennan, his second in the first 90 seconds of the fight. Got his black belt at the age of 18. And full value for it just by what we've seen and continue to see in the cage, John. Now, that, that's not something his dad just gave to him. He earned it. He has done everything that you could ask. Oh, someone looking for the arm right there. And step over. No, nope. continues on with the back. He's got the figure four. His body triangle now. Soto at four and two has never been submitted. Soto's got a good ground game. He is very tenacious on the ground. He goes after attacks. It's just sometimes when you end up in these positions, you're that one step, then all of a sudden two steps behind, and you can't make it up. That's what the difference is when you get into these levels. Brennan recorded a rear naked choke submission win over Thomas Lopez at Bellator 224, July of 2019. His father, Chris Halfway. Brennan, Halfway. on the right. Position, position. Position before position. submission from day one. Very keep smart. That arm, keep that on tight up. And you, you've seen that Lucas understands I have a lot of time keep here. I don't have to expend up. a hey, ton please, of energy. Please, I don't have to breathe. get crazy. Get I just need to start breaking him down step by step. Have I ever told you that Chris Brennan was in the first Pride Fighting Championship fight ever called at the Shido One, October 2003? Hey, flatten it out, flatten it out. Chris Brennan was one of the first guys. Take the he came out. into Take the Gracie the Academy, out. became a student, and you know, got a whole lot better than I did. And in fact, as we see his son continue to dominate Soto, he he ended up picking up a submission not once but twice in the same fight against Asian Bushwalker that night. So obviously, the apple does not fall far from the tree. And I think, with all respect to Chris Brennan, Lucas Brennan is going to be that much better. And he's looking to put the finishing touches on Johnny Soto here in round one. Look at Johnny's figuring that he's got his chin in there, but that can end quickly. All it takes is a little bit of a slide on that. There's a lot of pressure on that right now. Johnny Soto is trying to relax. It's tight. Lucas Brennan. That's what I was talking about. I said, you got time. He understands that. He knows it's just a matter of time before I break you down. Seven and oh, all seven fights in the Bellator MMA cage. And that's his third consecutive submission. Fifth. Submission victory and at 22. I mean, the featherweight division already on notice. <laughs> People are starting to notice. You can't have a guy that keeps on going out there and getting finishes with every fight that you don't have to start to take notice of. Let's take a look at what happens here. Beautiful job, sweeps the leg out. Takes him down. He's already taken him down before that. Wrist control just starts to drive him over. Gets the back. Figure four from there. And then when he gets the neck, he just slowly starts to slide that forearm under. Now he gets the hand over the top. Brings it back to a palm to palm. Slides it back over again. Gets the twist on the neck. 
that is tight. It's painful. And he just keeps on forcing that position till he gets the tap. Just like you would have done, Moro. All smiles. I don't know about maybe my dreams turn into a nightmare for uh, Johnny Soto, but all smiles for Lucas Brennan. Hey, the future of mixed martial arts, Bellator MMA, looking bright with youngsters like Brennan. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes officially. Three minutes, 34 seconds, round number one. By rear naked choke, the winner by submission, still undefeated, Lucas Skywalker Brennan. Skywalker, sky the limit. Lucas Brennan with another impressive submission victory. Right, Amanda? Absolutely, Moro. And since this is a... Uh... Make fun of Josh Thompson time. We will mention that you were supposed to fight his dad. You could have a 22-year-old, Josh. She's making me feel really old first. <laughs> Come on. I just, hey. my back is just feeling betrayed right now. All the knives in it over here. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to yes. be nicer uh, during the main card. All right. Let's talk about one of the fights we're going to see coming up tonight here at 9 Eastern on Showtime because this guy, Rafian Stas, will be fighting the winner of this particular fight, Leandro Higo versus Danny Sabatello. Uh, so let's start. Josh, I'm going to start with you because you've trained a little bit with Higo here. He told us, I want to see the despair in Danny Sabatello's face. How does he do that? He's got to be, he's got to get to the top position. I think if he gets to the top position, the way he'll do that is by getting to the sweeps. He will be taken down, okay? But he is good on the arm and guillotine, which can lead to that hook sweep, which he is very good at. And when he gets to that top position, he can do work. Lay down the vicious elbows on the ground and pound, which he goes nasty for. You look at the Pitbull brothers, Patricio and, and uh, Patricky. This is the camp that he comes from. He knows what it's like to get in there and get dirty. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think he needs to use his submission attacks, use his boxing, use his sprawling ball techniques, um, and, and just be, make it a gritty fight for Danny Sabatello. You know Danny's probably not going to engage you in the striking. You got you to gotta make him engage you where, you where you can. We hear a lot of trash talking from Danny Sabatello. Um, he did get real with us. He said he has been looking up to you and he has been following your career and he would like to face you. Yes, he has said nice things about you. Mr. Stotts there, what do you expect to see from the Italian gangster? Man, you know, I expect to see Danny be Danny, go out there, talk some crap, and go and get 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 to grappling. You know what I mean? He's gonna wrestle, 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 and he's gonna wrestle until he go can't wrestle no more. Um, he, we, we gotta see if he go can stand up to the task, you know? Because he's been very dominant, you know, in his in, in his fighting style and, and how he attacks. So uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. He's one of the fastest guys I've seen in, in lowering his level and getting in on the double legs and the takedowns. He can shoot from six, seven feet away and still get enough penetration to get the takedowns. Higo will not be prepared for that. So he's going to have to make sure that if he does get taken down, that he's looking to, to get to the sweep. Where Danny Sabatello has got to make sure that he gets the work in. He's got to score points when he's in that top position. Danny Sabatello, national attention this week uh, because of how much he has put on this fight. But he said, look, I know my trash talking means nothing. If I don't don't win. expect him to be nice to you though if you guys end up fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to get that in there at least before you know. I mean, I know. Uh, but when you look at it, these both these guys suck really bad, so it's gonna be really fun. And to fight. there we go. Tomorrow, <laughs> with that, it's time to send it back down to you for the final fight of the prelims. Oh, you kids better behave. Unlike Dan Moret and Killy's Moda, who are ready to do anything but behave in this preliminary battle at lightweight as we go to the tail of the tape number nine ranked Dan Moret against Elise Mota looking to move up in Bellator MMA both of these guys veteran fighters who have had fights against some of the very best both tough 15 and 7 for Dan Moret 12 and 3 for Achilles Mota here is Michael C. Williams Tonight here at Bellator 282, the time has come to conclude the prelims. We'll do it with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot eleven, weighing in 155 and one half pounds. His professional record: 12 wins, three losses. From Registro São Paulo, Brazil, presenting Kilhis Mota. And across the cage of adversary, out of the red corner, at six foot, weighing in 155 and one half pounds, as a professional, 15 victories, seven defeats, by way of Mankato, Minnesota, he fights out of Scottsdale, Arizona, Dan, the Hitman, Moran. And when the bell rings, 
the referee in charge, Kerry Hatley. Dan the Hitman Moret coming off a loss to Spike Carlisle, where Carlisle pulled off one of the biggest come from behind wins I've seen. A bloody battle, but Our Moret looking to bounce back ready, ready, against Loda, who's looking to snap a two fight losing streak. So plenty on the line, and they come out hungry. Shot, kick to the body by Moda and a right hand. He's got Dan Moret some trouble here. Moda, Minister of Mayhem early, feeding him a steady diet of right hands before they engage in some Muay Thai plum activity, delivering some knees. This is good for Dan. Dan needs to slow it down a little bit. Level change by Moda, looking for the takedown. He secures it. Moda came out like a guy hungry to get back on the winning track, and now he's taken the back of Dan Moret. Nice job by Dan Moret to get back to his feet. Moda very good on the ground. Outstanding submissions. Moret more of a wrestler. He's got good submissions, a lot of power submissions. Good with the Kimura, good with the chokes, good with the arm triangles. Moret said that pace and cardio would be his biggest advantages against Moda. And his uh, cardio being tested early as Moda putting on the pressure. And looking to take him down again, does so with a trip takedown. Moda now two for two in the takedown department, although the first time around didn't last long. No, but you put him right back down, and it's that return to the mat. You know, your dad, Moret, you work hard to get back to your feet, and all of a sudden you're finding yourself back in that right. same position, burning energy. And when you're getting hit like he's been getting hit by Moda, it, it, that burns energy too. So, Moret looking for a Kimura grip right, right now. He's got seven submission wins. None of them via Kimura. Well, all of you, right now, when you, with what you're seeing him do, he doesn't have the leg position to make this a submission. What he's trying to do is slow down Achilles Moda. And of course, Moret working with uh, Fight Ready MMA and Misahudo's gym and Scott Stella Arizona. Moda delivering some ground and pound. Moret trying to neutralize the wrist. Well, he's got a beautiful lace on that arm of Moret. Moret was able to finally get it free, but that's why Moda was able to land those shots. Moda coming off a split decision loss to Mike Hamill at Bellator 272 last December. He feels he, he won the fight, and again, a lesson a lot of fighters learn. Never want to leave it to the judge's blood. Dan Moret cut over the right eye. Did you see what caused it, John? No, I really didn't. The guys, all of a sudden, I saw his bleeding. All it takes is one slicing shot, be it by punch or elbow. Or it could be an accidental clash of heads and way they're situated, but we are checking for it, and Moret gets back to his feet again. And this is good for Dan Moret because he's right. If there's one thing about Moda, he does get tired when you press him in the fight. He's got he calls a lot of energy. Attacking the body with a left and a right hand. It was an elbow strike that cut Dan Moret. And Moret and Moda. Beautiful body. Oh, the for Moda and then Moret comes back with a head shot. He's blow for blow. And now Moret sniping with the left. And Moda rattling Moret. What an exchange. Both guys throwing heavy leather at each other. And Moret looking for the takedown. Moda snatches the neck to mute. The fistic fireworks momentarily anyway. Fierce exchange, liver kick by Moret from the southpaw stance, but it's Moda fishing for another takedown. Terrific exchanges, great action here in the final minute of this opening round between Dad the Hitman Moret and Killis Mota. Both guys at times throwing caution to the wind, just going after it. Thirty seconds remain in the first round. Moda. As Moret on the fence, Moret with a double wrist lock. Let's go. Squares up to Moda. 
momentarily. Moda now takes the back again. Waist lock. Looking for the takedown. Moret has to be careful not to hold on to the fence. Nice transition by Moda when he let go of that. Hey, they continue to let go when it comes to trucking leather. Dan Moret can't help himself. No, he's not. I love him. The hitman delivering a lot of hits and absorbing Absorbing's a couple, lot of hits three. from Tilly's Mota. Hey, you guys are swinging head down, left, right, left, right, left, right. You've got to clinch him and come up the middle with some knees or some uppercuts, okay? But hey, more than anything, he's going to keep shooting on you. We need you to initiate the clinch and the shots. Eu quero que você abra a distância com o cotovelo, cotovelo, na média distância com o cotovelo, beleza? On the ground position, here, this is the elbow, that's what makes the cut over the eye of Dan Marip. And then the freestyle, just winging go, shots, both guys Good. going after it. Moda burying his okay. head, Marip trying to land. Good left hand that finally lands there at the end. There were moments in this where both guys were just saying, that's it, I'm going for it. I'm biting down on the mouthpiece, I'm slinging leather, and they both went after it. And while fans Our enjoyed man, every ready? second of it, Moretta's corner would love to see him clinch and deliver strikes from in close, delivers a head kick, but Moda closing the gap immediately and backing Moret to the fence. Takes him down. Moret with the half butterfly. Saw him, saw him take away that left leg. Broke that table down, puts Moret on the ground. Moda now three for four in the takedown department. Moret trying to neutralize his offensive weapons from this position and looking to try to make his way back to his feet somehow, a hip escape. He really is content to get that arm, but Moda delivers the right hand. Well, it's the lacing of the arm, the left arm of Dan Moret by Moda with his left arm that's causing him the problem. Now that's why you're seeing it. He's got a good leg turn. He's trying to get himself back to his feet. Good effort by Dan Moret to get up. The question is, can he keep himself there? And this is where, this is what is mentally, it's exhausting when you work so hard to get back to your feet, and then the guy returns you right back to the mat. And immediately, well, Moda tried to get a hook in, and Moret, meanwhile, gets back to his feet. So, Moda oh, takes him down. Moret able to oh, fight Brad. back, but as you mentioned, John, all kinds of energy being expended on both sides, yep. and it's Moda that maintains control. And Moret's corner clamoring for elbow strikes. He delivers. Motor figure four in the legs there. It's a nice job taking the legs. You saw Dan Murray bring his legs out of that so he can get himself back to his feet. So he, nice job by Moda. Better job by Moret to escape. You know, it is. It's, this is a war of attrition right now. Moda's working very hard. As Moret said, he wanted to push the pace. Well, both guys are pushing the pace. We're going to see which one in the end wins. For positioning, the fight for the takedown. Moda attacking the neck of Moret, the sweat though, helping Moret escape. It's the kind of fight where you find out what kind of deodorant your opponent's using, John. <laughs> Midway through the round and the fight. This is an exhausting fight. Both guys have been grappling heavily, using a ton of strength. Moda picking up Dan Moret. Just a grueling, grueling style of fight, and at times, super exciting when they yeah. decide to go after it. They really do it. Moda goes after the takedown again and again. Moret able to get back up to a base, a vertical base. You'll see Moto try to keep his hands clasped together. That way he can take, elevate the hips of Dan Moret, bring him back down to the canvas. Moret attacking the body with some elbow strikes when he gets the chance. See, Moret was able to withstand that, get those hands apart. Now Moto's only on a single. And Moret looking for that standing Kimura, the double wrist lock. And now delivering a series of knees from the Thai Plum. Front kick by Moret. And while 
majority of the shots missed. He's, he's going back on the offensive attack. And his right hand by Moda. Body kick from Moret. Inside calf kick by Moret. This is where Moret has to make up whatever disadvantages he may face when involved in the grappling department. Oh, he got popped in the nose there by Moda. Walked right into it. Nasty left hand from Moret and the level change. And now Moret looking for the guillotine. Not sure if he has it all the way. It looks like it's on the jawline, but you see Moda pop his head out yep. there. Moda's never been submitted. Moret finding himself on his back, but not accepting the position, delivering some short elbow strikes from close guard, controlling Moda's posture, maybe hoping to force a stand-up. Both have had success in the stand-up striking department. The takedowns by Moda proving to be the difference as we head to the third and final round. Stop. Easy up, man. John, the official, unofficial scorecard is in your possession. What does it say right now? Unofficially, I've got nice I've got Achilles Moda ahead in hey, this fight, but we got this could switch the course even, okay? yeah. just with one shot because both guys have put a ton of energy out. They've both absorbed damage. Let's double that. It's really find your this is a war of attrition. Here comes that double wrist lock, as you say. I say Kimura, hold by Damaret to get Achilles Moda off of the cage. Moda comes after him. Nice right hand straight. And then Moret decides to try to lock up that guillotine. Here we go. Just look. Great fight so far. Sure thing. Third and Third final round, round of what has been an entertaining affair on what has been an entertaining portion of Bellator 282, the prelims. Main right, card go, coming up, 90 to 6 Pacific on Showtime. But now it's go time once again between Dan Moret looking to bounce back from a loss to Spike Carlisle against Khalees Mota looking to end a two-fight losing streak. And you know that Hats would like to see them fight like they've got nothing to lose here with less than five minutes remaining. Oh, there's a nasty right hand by Mota. What a lot of clean right hand. Red needs to get his head off the center line there. Oh, lead left uppercut. Nicely done by Moret. Fighting out of the southpaw stance. Marked up the face of Mota, mouse underneath the right eye of the Brazilian fighter. Nice lead right hook curl around the guard of Moda by Moret. Ranging by Moret, but it's Moda that nails him with the one two and knocking him off balance, and rolling his ankle. That left hook landed clean. Jab lands for Moda. And again, sticks Moret with the jab. Moret lands that straight left down the middle. Nice jab, but it's just one punch. And now Moret in the clinch with Moda. Moda backing him up against defense. Overhooks. Moda looking to take out Moret's base. Moda's got that body lock. He's got both arms. He does not have his hands together, but he's been successful multiple times. Sweeping the leg away and putting Dan Moret down on his back. He's attempted. Ten takedowns has Moda, secured four of them, but it's Moret 
in the stand-up. He's had success with that liver kick from the southpaw stance and would like to continue to tattoo the body of Achilles Mota. But Mota giving as good as he's getting and has the slight advantage in terms of total strikes landed. Yeah, but he's landed the heavier shots overall. That left hand of Mota has just landed multiple times and caused problems for Moret. Moda looking for the takedown. Shucked off by Moret. It's a cap kick by Moret. Counter right hand by Moda's again. They swing wildly. Two minutes left in the fight. Moda, Moda's mouth is open there. He's starting to breathe heavy. Got tagged with the right hand from Moret. Moret fainting. And then delivering the left down the middle. Leads with the left, misses with the right. Right, right now, Moret looks like the fresher fighter. Although, Moda is winning the round, in my opinion. Moret is the ranked fighter, number nine again. Sticks the nasty jab, another jab from the southpaw stance. So Moret beginning to land from range. And Moda wants nothing more to do with the striking and takes Moret back down to the canvas for the fifth time in the fight. And he's keep pushing on that head, start to wiggle his legs free. Elbow Oda wants to climb up the body of Moret. It was an elbow that cut Moret over the right eye. He'd like to do the same to <laughs> Moto. Final minute in the fight. And to Moret desperate trying to get both. Back to his feet, but now the hook in by Moda. Moda doing a great job getting that left arm as he's done Moret, which he's done fight. exactly yep. all throughout right. the fight. That's been a difference in him being able to control the ground position at times. No quit in Dan the Hitman Moret, even against Spike Carlin on last fight. He was put to sleep. It was a technical yeah. submission. And uh, well, Moret may be looking for a similar turn of events here. Time running out. Moda. Really an outstanding fight by both gentlemen. Achilles Moda really looking good. Great with the takedowns. Dan Moret in incredible condition, taking big shots coming back in this fight. Take a look at some of these. That right hand landed clean. You saw Moret going for the kick. Counter right hand by Moda. Left hook, that left hook landed throughout the fight. You see the wobble from Moret. The wrestling was a difference. Moda's wrestling, which you would have thought Moret might have had the advantage in the wrestling game. Moda ended up getting the takedowns, controlling position, landing big shots. Just an outstanding performance by both men. What has been an outstanding uh, night of preliminary card action. This lineup, I mean, we said it, loaded from top to bottom. And many incredible performances here during the prelims and a great way to finish it off with Moda taking on Moret. the face of a warrior Bellator MMA where warriors rule John and both these guys Moda and Moret earning their keep tonight but only one 
can move on. Yeah. Michael C. Williams possesses the name of that one. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges, Brian Miner, Michael Murtha, and Dave Torelli. All have it the same, 30 to 27. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Kelly Mota. Clean sweep on the judges' scorecard. Gillies Mota, hard fought win to snap a two fight losing streak, and in the process, he sends Moret on his way to a two fight losing streak. But again, Dan Moret, the kind of DNA you want in a fighter. And uh, nothing to you. What, what more could you ask for? The man was fighting the entire time. Great job by both guys. Big win by Achilles Mota. All right, let's put a button on the preliminary proceedings with Amanda Guerra. Mora, thank you. What a night here so far. And we are just getting started. Coming up in just about 15 minutes on Showtime. You do not want to miss a single fight. We have the final two fights in the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix quarterfinals. Which two fighters will be one step closer to $1 million? And our main event, the legend, one of the best to ever step in the cage, Gegard Mousasi versus Johnny the Human Cheat Code, Eblin. Eblin undefeated says, I will shock the world and dethrone the champion. We'll see you at 9 Eastern on Showtime. Musasi is a monster. Sometimes nightmares. Oh, the dream catcher. Happen when you're wide awake. Looking to smash the dreams of the number one contender. Two-time world champ, Gegard, the dream catcher, Musasi, goes for his 50th career win. Best in my profession. But Johnny the Human Cheat Code, Eblin, has all-world talent. Musasi, I'm ready to take your ass out. And the attitude to match. <laughs> Bellator MMA, Musasi versus Eblen, tonight, live on Showtime. To be the best, you must beat the best. And since joining Bellator MMA, Gegard Mousasi has proven he is undeniable in that claim. And Mousasi training the Red King. Gegard is a beast. He may not look it. He may not even comb his hair. God dang, that man can fight. But lying in wait is the undefeated number one contender, Johnny Eppner. Musasi said he didn't know who the I was. I'm right here, dog. I'm ready to take your out. Let's get up in here. And let's make that fight happen. On Friday, June 24th at the Mohegan Sun Arena, can the human cheat code score one of the biggest upsets of all time? Or will Musasi seal his fate as the greatest middleweight in Bellator history? is Bellator 282 Crossroads and Saucy versus Evan. In early 2017, Musasi was already regarded as one of the top middleweights on the planet. I've never felt so alive. With wins over two former UFC world champions and a five-fight winning streak intact, the question remained, where was his championship opportunity? And as frustrations boiled over, Musasi would exit the UFC before ever getting his shot at gold. But later that summer, 
Gay Guard Musasi would send shockwaves across the world. When it was announced that he had signed with Scott Coker and Bellator MMA, becoming one of the promotion's biggest signings to date. I've never felt so alive. In Musasi's first Bellator bout, he defeated longtime middleweight poster boy and former Bellator world champion Alexander Slamenko earning himself a world championship opportunity. And Gegard Mousasi will bring a six-fight winning streak into his first attempt at becoming a Bellator MMA champion. At the landmark Bellator 200 event in London, England, Mousasi would relish in his moment of glory defeating Rafael Cavallo by TKO. that's ever had the Strike Force light heavyweight title, Dream middle and light heavy, and now the Bellator middleweight title. Who is it that you think it should get that next shot at this title? I think everyone wants to see Rory McDonald. Hopefully he doesn't chicken out and uh, the other fight. And after another emphatic win, this time against the Red King, Rory McDonald, Musasi looked unstoppable. And still, Bellator In 2019, however, he would come up short against the jiu-jitsu specialist Rafael Lovato Jr., losing his world championship in the same arena he had won it one year prior. But the former Strike Force and Dream Champion was resilient. After a decision victory against the Dragon Leota Machida, Musasi would earn the right to face welterweight champion Douglas Lima in a high stakes main event for the vacant middleweight title. Musasi secured his second reign as champion with a shutout over Lima, beginning a chain of highlight performances including back-to-back -back TKO wins over John Salter and Austin Vanderford. <laughs> Although, when you're at the top, the challenges never let up. Because now, Musasi must overcome his most unpredictable test to date. A young, hungry, an explosive challenger who truly believes his time is now. I can negate a lot of the stuff that he does by keeping a high pace, staying in his face, and making an un uncomfortable fight. But the champ still isn't convinced. People look good knocking out unknown names, and then uh, you have to knock out big names. Is Dark Horse Eblen prepared for what Musasi has in store for him? Find out on episode two of Bellator 282 Crossroads. Last time on Bellator 282 Crossroads, we followed the story of Gegard Musasi and his rise to become the best middleweight fighter in the world. It's all about Gegard Musasi, the Bellator MMA middleweight champion. Once overlooked and underappreciated, the champ now boasts an unwavering confidence as he welcomes any and every challenge from the middleweight ranks. I can beat anybody, and uh, definitely one of the best middleweights at this moment, 100%. Enter his newest rival, the human cheat code, Johnny Eblen. Whilst building his career, Eblen has shown extreme confidence in his fight game with a profound determination to win at all costs. I got hands, baby! I got diamonds, hands, baby! Musasi, who has fought a who's who of top names throughout his career, remains unimpressed. People look good knocking out unknown names. We have to knock out big names. This is Bellator 282 Crossroads. Musasi versus Epic.
Training out of American Top Team in Coconut Creek, Florida, Johnny Eblen has stormed through the competition since his debut in 2019. Jeblin remains unbeaten and wins by unanimous decision. And it was a smooth start to life in Bellator for Eblin, picking up decision wins over Chauncey Foxworth, Mauricio Alonso, and Taylor Johnson. Until this point, Eblin had showcased his ferocious wrestling, but questions always remained over his striking. But it didn't take long for him to silence those critics. Eblin would showcase his untamed power with a fierce TKO stoppage over Daniel Madrid, a victory which would earn him the moniker of Diamond Hands. Madrid goes down and Madrid's in trouble. Madrid is finished. Johnny Eblin improving to 8-0, 4-0 in Bellator with his fourth knockout. From here, the Eblin hype would only gain more and more momentum with back-to-back -back wins over Travis Davis and Colin Huckbody, progressing his climb up the middleweight ranks. Honestly, John Salter, I signed a bout agreement to fight you in Florida, and you it out. I don't know if you got hurt or if you it out, but I want to see you in this goddamn cage, dog. Let's go. Let's gear up, and let's get after it. In Eblin's fight against then number one contender, John Salter, he showed that no cheat codes were needed, soaring to a decision victory in his most mature performance to date. And now with less than 30 seconds left, Johnny Eblin on the cusp of conquering the biggest name of his career, looking to move to 11 and 0. With the spotlight fixed on the Iowa native, Eblin made his next objective abundantly clear. Musashi said he didn't know who that was. I'm right here, dog. I'm ready to take your ass out. Let's get up in here. And let's make that fight happen. At Bellator 282, the future of the middleweight division will be decided. I'm telling you, I'm the best, and they're gonna know from now, you know?